What was the date on the last meeting, Diane? Was it the 14th? Um, it was the 19th. So you want it before the consent agenda? You want it before the consent agenda or anything? All right, we'll call the meeting to order, and then after the flag salute, we have a request to go into executive session after that. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the request is to for the city commission recess into executive session for consultation with attorney for body for which be deemed privileged in the attorney client relationship in order to discuss a legal matter that has recently come to my attention seeking a legal opinion and advice. The executive session will be 20 minutes and open at uh, it's just six o'clock so. Who, who do you want the executive session to include? The city commission and the city attorney and the city manager, or who do you want? City attorney and city manager. Okay. Okay, does someone make a motion to go into executive session? Pete, you are? You're going to make a motion to go into executive session? Yes, I'll make the motion. Second. <coughs> Randy Nichols? Yes. Kevin Allen? Yes. Pete Allen? Yes. Lindsey Watts? Yes. Jolyn Mitchell? Yes. Pete, is action anticipated? I'm sorry. Is there any action anticipated? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. 
Scott, are you on? Scott? Did you join the meeting? Were you asking me a question? Yes. Hey, our uh, yeah. commissioners are in executive session, so if you just want to hang tight, um, we'll get to you yeah, soon as I, they get out. I was trying to make sure that, yeah, I just was trying to make sure that, um, that you guys will receive the meeting point like that. So uh, yeah. whenever you guys are ready, I just I'm not mine on mute. Uh, right now. Thank you. Okay, and if you want to hang up and call back in in about ten Perfect. minutes, that's fine. They still have about twelve more minutes. Uh, since it's already connected, I'm going to go ahead and leave it. Okay. Don't have to get you. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. Yeah. Thank you. Or right, when you did you want to, when do you need and how many minutes do you want me to call back? Um. You can go back in about five, five to ten minutes. Okay. So I'll call you back at uh, six fifteen. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Need a motion to close. Come out of executive session because you came out a little early. Okay, I would make a motion to um, that we came out of executive session early. Second. I'll second. Are we sure that the mics are working? Is mine up? Can you hear Pete? Can you hear me, Pete? Who's talking? Can't hear me. Yes. Okay, I seconded it. Um, oh, you so did. yeah, so okay. I wasn't sure okay. if you heard what I was saying or not. I may not have been plugged in. Okay. But I am now. Thank you. Okay, Kevin Allen. Yes. Randy Nichols. Yes. Lindsey Watts. Yes. Pete Allen. Yes. Joanne Mitchell. Yes. Uh, next, we have the consent. I, I, excuse me. I I would like to go on record uh, as being uh, unable to vote yes on any spending matter until receiving the legal opinion from our city attorney. Okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. Next, we're going to move to the consent agenda. We have the approval of several minutes that we had from special meetings, um, an, an appropriation ordinance for four hundred fifty-nine thousand eight eleven ninety-one, and then we also have a consideration of Fort Scott Housing Authority appointment, Edna Erie, recent or resident, excuse me, commissioner, four-year term. I would move to approve the consent agenda. Second. I second. I would like discussion. I would, I would like uh, the minutes of the meeting, uh, minutes of the May 19, 2020 meeting, uh, to be uh, to to include a uh, a. Uh, a statement from me that that I made and that uh, what what I want to include in the minutes of the meeting is that the following uh, while the discussion on the uh, uh, the uh, capital LA program was going on I Pete Allen informed the Commission that I was having a hard time hearing the discussion due to a malfunction of my hearing device and before the vote was confirmed I asked for the issue to be reopened for discussion because I was unable to hear the discussion uh, due to the disability uh, which was I was unable to hear the previous discussion uh, after advice from our attorney Kevin Allen made a motion to reconsider the vote to allow more discussion and I seconded and Commissioner <clears throat> Allens both voted yes Commissioner Nichols Commissioner Watts and Commissioner Mitchell voted no the motion was defied denied three to two I feel that was a violation uh, if nothing else, the American Disabilities Act. Uh, I don't think that uh, that there was much consideration given to a reasonable request, and I would like that entered into the minutes of the meeting. Jeff, we kind of spoke about this earlier. Um, maybe not this. Ex uh, well, this situation in particular from the previous meeting. But um, in reference to the email, Pete, that you sent out here, uh, I believe today is when I received it, um, just asking uh, what would be the steps that needed to be taken. And also looking back, because I did rewatch the meeting from last time, um, and I've had several comments um, from the public as well, that uh, I, I would absolutely stopped and repeated what I had said for the discussion on that point. Um, I remember that fairly vividly. Uh, I would have, I would have repeated myself if necessary. Um, I know that I said for discussion, I would like to add, and then I went into it. And I do feel like I do a fairly good job at trying to eat my microphone um, without um, 
and, and, and there have been other moments when people are not speaking into their microphone that um, you have said specifically that you are hearing them. So I apologize that that happened. Um, it, it's unclear when that happens. And if you could speak up, if we're in the middle of the meeting and, and something's happening and you don't know, then I, I would absolutely go back. It did not seem like that was the case in that situation. And that would be, I, I guess, discussion on why I said no. Um, but Jeff, did you, that was, that was kind of, I guess I, I, I said what I was asking well, you earlier. Pete, can you hear me? Is my mic working? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going from my recollection of the video. We'd have to watch it for sure, and I'm looking at the minutes. And what it says is that, and from what I recall, um, there was some discussion. And what notice, page is that, Jeff? It looks like page five of the minutes from uh, five the 519 meeting. If you're looking at the PDF, it's page 23 of 130. Um, and it's in number two, 2020 Capital Outlay Program. Um, I know there were times in that meeting, and there have been times in most meetings where the issue has been raised as to whether um, Commissioner Allen's able to hear properly. Um, it looks to me like, and my recollection was, that the, the vote was called by the city uh, clerk, and it, what's recorded here is that it was called and seconded, and then uh, Nichols, Watts, Mitchell voted yes, and uh, Kevin Allen abstained, and Pete Allen voted <coughs> no. So. And if it seems to my recollection that it was only after the no vote that the issue of, well, I didn't hear was raised. And at that point, he talked about vote being confirmed. The vote was done at that point, unfortunately. Um, and the only way to handle it at that point would have been the motion to reconsider, which was a, a decision that the commission can make, and they, they voted against it. So, you know. I would say at that point, I wasn't aware that it was a hearing issue as opposed to more of a parliamentary procedure and we weren't in the correct section for that discussion. That was my understanding at that moment and the reason that you know, I, I think, thought it was the way it was. I think we've all noticed that Pete has trouble hearing awesome. and this could have all been avoided if we would simply went back and let him speak or let, let, him, let him listen again to what was going on. Had uh, I known that that was so the issue, it, I absolutely would have. I'd, I'd just like to add that. I didn't even hear. I was trying to talk. So, Jeff, at this point, what is the next step that we should take? If we well, can have some help with that. I mean, I think that it's so, important to say that, I mean, Pete, if we have uh, instruments that we're using that you can't hear us, please raise your hand or wave us or something because we don't know that you can't hear us. So that would be my, my forethought on that of please indicate to us when you cannot hear uh, the next thing that's going on. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, I, I believe that the, the part of the problem has now been solved. Um, we got Pete a new headset that the cord runs down and plugs into a, a box of sorts. I don't know. I called up the next day, and, and I asked very um, – um, prominent or whatever the word is, I asked very sternly that we please get Pete's uh, a device to hear on so we don't have to deal with this every meeting. That next day, I believe it was, Susan called and, and we, had a, we had a set of headphones. And I, I believe Pete can hear just fine tonight. Can you hear? Yes. So if, if everybody can just scoot up to their mics and, and talk loud, I mean, it's going to seem like it's loud to us. But, but let's take into consideration, too, um, not beating on a on an old drum here, but Pete just had his 80th birthday Saturday. First of all, I'd like to say happy birthday, Pete. And second of all, the reason his hearing has gone is not necessarily because he's worked in the same field I have with heavy equipment, things of that nature. But he served and he was in the service for years and ran and shot heavy artillery and lost his hearing. So please take that in consideration from now on when he asks for help or he may he may stutter and stammer again. But it's okay to reiterate the questions and the discussion we have to make sure that someone that was elected in our community has the oppor opportunity to hear the discussion and vote accordingly. That's what I want to say. I do not think that the rest of us uh, that are elected here, officials here, that there's one person here that would deny the respect and the thankfulness of his service to our country. So... Pete, I would say to you, if there's something that you cannot hear us, you don't even have to say anything. Raise your hand. Throw your hand in the air. We did not know since you voted. We did not know you couldn't hear. 
I informed you that I couldn't hear, and that was the reason why I asked for the... the I, I would just like to move on and have this entered into the minutes okay. and move on from here. Not a problem. All right, so um, we... Uh, did we have a? Mo I'm sorry. Did we have a motion to approve the consent yeah, agenda? And a yeah. second. And a second. So would you take roll? Can 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 I say something else? Um, one other thing that was in the minutes that I didn't see in the minutes, and that's why I, why I asked about the uh, what date it was, was there was discussion in there uh, last time by a city um, employee about hand slapping of a local auctioneer. Well, that local auctioneer watched the meeting, and I'm not so sure it shouldn't be in our minutes also, if that could be added. I, I, I will tell you, I do not take minutes verbatim. Okay. I mean, I just... Well, it's I not even to, that we had I a... try to summarize the minutes, okay? I think the more you probably put in, the more you probably are legally responsible for. So, I, I just try to... I think if you if we say it, we're legally responsible anyway. Am I right, Jeff? I'm just Jeff? saying I I just don't type the minutes out for me. Well, I'm not I'm not. Don't think that I'm saying that this is something that you've done wrong, Diane. I'm just saying that I would think it would be added in there because there's not even a it's it, it, this this uh, director update only had two items on here that we discussed and we discussed a third one and that was the uh, sale of property and it was quite a lengthy discussion and there's nothing even on here about it. Um, and, and, and I, w I would like to, uh, say also that I spoke to that individual because I was very, uh, prevalent when that happened with this certain instance. And, and, and we made mention of slapping hands. I believe Joanne, uh, you heard the slapping of the hands deal whenever we was talking about that. Dave, do you remember that? Yeah. And, and that, that I was didn't a, say it. yeah, you did. So we can go back and watch the tape if you want. I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I well, well you, I, you just. I don't know what, what it has bearing on. Uh, it. Dave, I, I I'd like for you to move up to the phone okay. so I can. Hear I don't know what bearing it has on it, but what were we talking about that we that You're I talking got about the city auction? Slapped. Okay, now I yeah, see. yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. I the, the reason okay. I'm I'm bringing this up is because the the, the statement that was made was we had an out of town auctioneer that was going to do this for free for us, and because the in town auctioneer slapped our hands, it cost us a lot of money to do the city sale. That's not true. That's Be not true. That That's is not, not true at all. That wasn't the discussion, That's no. Right. He was yeah. within 5%. Yeah. yeah. But so let fact. me clarify. If, if Let me clarify here. What The hand slapping, that was a wrong term. I shouldn't have used that. What it was was we, we had made a decision to go with the out-of-town person, and the... Other auctioneer, local, very good auctioneer, made it known that, that we need to look at that again. And I should not have used the term hand slap. What I was trying to say was that we realized we should have handled it differently. So we were called on the carpet, basically. I was the and, one that brought that yeah, to yeah. your attention. And we did the right thing. We didn't bring it back to the commission. Uh, I made the decision to go within the 5%. So if I upset anybody by saying that, now I get the hand. So I'm sorry, Kevin. Now I get the hand slapping. I didn't get what you were talking about. So well, yes, I said it, and I did not mean anything it, by it other than we we need to make sure we do the right thing from here on out, and we learn from that. And I have a under the sale of the property, I took your advice, and and I have a a, a way to sell it that won't cost us anything, and we can move on. So well, and the reason I bring this up, I want to finish this because it's yeah. important to me. Okay. I was in, I was. Uh, 100% invest in this from day one because that local auctioneer told me that he was upset that he didn't get this and he told me the numbers and then I'm the one that called up here a year ago mm -hmm. and I said, hey, this guy was within 1% but then I hear at the meeting that the out-of-town auctioneer was going to do it for free. Marty Reed is a good he friend of mine but that's what was said that night. That, that was said that that out-of-town auctioneer was going to do it for free. You can go back. Are you talking about last meeting? Yes. The only thing that I remember us talking about that was going to happen for free was we were talking about the county um, was able to run their auction for free and yeah, that yeah. we would like to look at doing that for ourselves as well. That's all I remember I mean, I that was. I, if I said free, I don't know why I would have said that because that was, he was with, the dialogue was within a percent. That's really right. back to you. That. You didn't say it, Dave. Didn't talk about you didn't say it and we can move on. Yeah. But the fact is that I wanted to apologize on behalf of, of the city to the local auctioneer because he was very offended by it. Well, and it was sorry. within 1%. The numbers were 15% is what 
Lance Anderson auction who bid it, 14%, Marty Reed. Lance Anderson said the city of Fort Scott could take care of their own advertising, which advertising, which ended up costing $437.16, and Marty Reed was going to do $1,500 worth of advertising. That's the true facts. All right. Let me make it perfectly clear, and Lance, I will call him. Lance was very professional when he called me about it, too, and we had good dialogue, and we were wrong. And we didn't bring it back to you. I made it right without bringing it back. That's the reason I think you want to know if there was any notes or discussion on changing it. And there wasn't because I made the decision, which I had the power to do, to make it right and go. We called Marty, said we're going to do this, and that's what we did. So Yeah, within hours, it had been made right. And I appreciate that. I really do. And, and I even had called Marty myself because Marty's a friend of mine, and I didn't want to think that. I just wanted the right thing done. I will done. call Mr. Anderson tomorrow. Thank you. Anything else with the consent agenda? We we'll call the question. We're going to. We've got a motion. We have a I'm motion in a second. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. You're <clears throat> correct. I'm sorry. Randy Nichols. Yes. Lindsey Watts. Yes. Kevin Allen. No. Pete Allen. No. And was that approval with the amendment to the minutes? In your. I didn't make the motion. Lindsey's. I don't know if anybody. Lindsey, sorry. I don't know why I looked at you. Was that approval with amendments? Sure. Yes. Jolene Mitchell. Yes. Um, next, I believe we were going to have a public hearing. We will not have a public hearing on this. Um, I, Robert handled this. I agree that this building is in needs some attention and we need to make some decisions, but. Um, I'm not clear on when we condemn a building, what all that means to the city. So I've asked the attorney today, uh, but so I will bring this back at a later date, not very much later, but okay. what? We need to open this public we hearing. Oh, I we, thought I we, could we, that, oh, we got a caller. Yes. The uh, property owner is connected, but we have to open it. Okay. All right. Open the public hearing. Sorry. Go ahead, Scott. Hey, we got. We have to open the public I moved to open hearing. The public hearing. We're all talking at once. So I moved to open anything. the public hearing. Second. Uh, discussion. I. Oh, we have I to vote. I've got a. I have to be call roll. Pete Allen. We're opening the public hearing. You're just going to open a public hearing, so. There, so a, you can discuss. Oh, okay, we can go back and uh, do a citizen comments. Yeah, there's a, there's somebody on the phone that that's on. Uh, somebody on here. Comments. Okay, well I can't hear that. So go, yeah. Uh, okay. What? Push what? Hey, hold on just a second. Mute. Hey, no, I muted him. I okay. mute, I've got him muted, Kevin. Can you hear me? I muted him. Just a okay. second. All right. Randy Nichols. <laughs> yes. Lindsey Watts. Yes. Kevin Allen. Yes. Jolyn Mitchell. Yes. Okay. Jeff, before you put him back on. Okay. This is the owner of the building. He needs to talk to me. So we, we I don't want I don't want to have a public hearing at this point. What I want to do is uh, Dave, if you would move up to the mic so I can hear you, please. Who who is this? His, I think his name's Scott Johnson. Scott, can I talk to him? Mute him. I have a. If you guys want to be caught on that, I said, oh. Shit, are we talking about Ben North Dash or not yet? I can't understand what is going on in this meeting. Yeah, hey, Scott, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Ken. Okay. Are we, are we, uh, are we talking about Ben North Castle? That is under I, LSD, yeah. Yes, that's what we're, uh, we're, hey, Scott, I, I have a non-profit, high-technology company that basically does all the technology for Ben North Castle. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to have to ask them to come in here and talk to me about it. Okay. 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 Okay.
Yeah, like I didn't want the whole thing collapse, but guess what? That's the safest way to take that all that wood down is you let it fall down. Point being, man, I was gonna blow it with the film. I, I don't know if you guys are able to hear me or not. This guy's interested in it. I want to know what's going on in the certified letter. And if we want to condemn it, then let's look at the engineer report that I got. That was emergency deal back in August of you know, last year. Uh, so I mean, I, I want to hear your guys' comments, but we need to use Zoom because this is crazy. I can't tell who's talking and Scott, things like that. Scott, this is Gabe Morgan. This is Gabe Morgan, the city manager. I've met you. I am taking. Yeah, how you doing? Okay, good. I, I am taking this on. We are not going to condemn the building tonight. Okay. I need to talk. Okay. To, I need to talk to you tomorrow. You need to call me and get in touch with me. Ben Ford. Yes. Okay. Uh, what time? Uh, what time you want to do that? What time? Uh, you, call me you, call me any, you call me anytime in the afternoon, and I'll be available. I don't want any time like that. Actual time, three fifteen. I mean, exact time, sir. Uh, Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Good time. Okay. Uh, right. Please, you have my you have my email address. Yes. Info at earthalways.org. Okay. I want to make sure everybody's on the same page of this. I, I, you know, the reason I've invested in this community is because I, you know, I, I you know, I, it's fun. It, it's whatever. That's why I have my own personal. Home out in Bourbon County, okay? Yep. Uh, yeah, I can, I can be pretty damn difficult to work with, but I'm not trying to be on this, okay? I, I want to do what I'm... I understand. Okay? I, now, just, I just now took it over. I want to kind of... The point is, is I'm going to back away from it, and I'm going to give it to this high-end technology company. You guys are going to be tickled to death, okay? But that's what I want on public hearing, and, but I don't want that, you know... When we're getting into logistics, everything else, it's nobody's business on public deal. That is the game plan that I have spoke with the Chamber of Commerce. I spoke with who's in charge of public staff. I didn't get a chance to minister, but I, I, during this COVID thing, I have done my due diligence to see, you know, I've gotten a hold of a lot of people. So, you know, I know everybody, you know, I hope everybody's healthy. I hope everybody's staying, you know, safe and everything. Uh, Everybody is kind of stressed out. I was listening to the meeting when I joined in. Uh, with uh, I use Zoom when I have my enterprise meetings and stuff like that. It does take it much more. You're able to raise your hand. It already dictates every single thing that everybody says. So even though the the transcriber is taking notes, you know I, I don't think anybody was trying to. Anybody, but everybody's kind of on edge. Okay. All right. Very good, Scott. Something you excited about. You call and me. You call me. You call me, that's, yeah. you call me tomorrow too, okay? Okay. Right. Two o'clock. Yes. Uh, you guys need me on the phone or anything else? I mean, like, well, uh, everything else. Yeah, we're we're going to close the hearing. We're not going to talk about it. All right. Okay. Everybody, stay safe. Stay safe. I can hang up, correct? Right? Yeah. Ten four. Rock and roll, baby. All right. Thanks, guys. Good night. So, well, do we need a motion to table this? I think we've reached the, the point where the technology is limiting us significantly here. So I think if we make it clear, if I understand what you're trying to do, is you're going to remove this, not take any action, yeah. and it'll come up again at some other at time some other before point. any action is taken. Yeah. So I say we just vote on closing the hearing and be done with it. I move to close the public hearing. Second. Kevin Allen. Yes. Pete Allen. Yes. Lindsey Watts. Yes. Randy Nichol. Yes. Jolyn Mitchell. Yes. Susan. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to do a quick um, financial review of where we are today. Um, at the table, you have a paper that looks like this. No. Well, maybe. I don't yeah, know. Is it in this? I didn't see that one, Susan. Kevin, are you looking for it? It's right here in front of your nameplate. Yeah, there it is. I'm 
going to start with the general fund. Um, and what this is, is basically expenditures from January to May 31st. Um, and I'm comparing it from 2019 to 2020 to kind of get an idea of where we are as far as revenues. Our property tax is down about $4,500. Sales tax and use tax is down $78,000. Now, that's not just in one month. That's the five months. So we've lost a little bit every month. Um, for May, we actually were down $20,000. For franchise fees, we're down $18,000. Um, I can't tell you why that is other than it's based on um, use. So um, businesses. Actually, company. I think it's because we didn't have a real cold winter because most of the taxes were down. Um, franchise taxes were down in the gas company. Okay. So, um, and then other fees that we have, I was expecting this to be a lot lower than it is um, because we haven't been running municipal court, but it's only down 4800 so total overall, we're down about $100,000 um, in the general fund. Our expenses are only down $61,000. But keep in mind that we didn't start holding our budget until around the first part of April. And so we've got about two months here where we've kind of held line, um, only purchasing things that are necessary. So over the next few months, we'll have the ability to capture a little bit more savings. Um, Yes. Susan, did you say the twenty thousand dollars was down? The sales tax was that? Did you say it's March? Yes, it's March, March. but we okay. actually get yeah. it in May. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, there's March. about a two so months. April. Yeah, April yeah, will be next be month. Next, yeah. Yes, that is true. Um, so this will be something that we have to monitor very closely every single month. Um, jumping over to special streets. Um, our gas taxes actually came in um, pretty average. I think we'll see a drop in our next quarter. So that'll be something that we'll need to watch very closely as well. Expenses are about the same, um, up just a little bit. We expected that in special streets. Um, CVB, which is our visitor center, the revenues are down about 21000 We expect that to be even deeper um, over the next few months. Um, and our expenses are down accordingly. So um, we continue to watch that fund very closely. Water utility, um, our revenues are up 39000 which is expected since we did a 3% increase. So people are paying their water bills, their utility bills. Um, expenditures are down 133000 So we're holding the line there. I think that's very good. For the wastewater utility, our revenues are up 186000 and that is due to ADM has been processing more. Um, and so we've actually we've had a pretty good increase there. Um, our expenditures are down 174000 So again, we're holding the line, doing really well in that area. Um, sewer utility, our revenues are up $1,600, which is about the 3%. And our expenditures are down 15000 So... I feel like we're doing a very good job in our utilities as far as uh, making sure that we're only purchasing the necessary items. Speaking of the utilities, have you been able to track them with this all this money we spent to make sure we're saving like they said we was? Um, they are still putting the, that in. Oh, as far as the electric? Yes. You will not see that for a full year. Um, I have talked to them about their <laughs> equations and how they're going to submit that information to me. And they're working on um, a format. And then I will be able to log in at any time and see the, the comparisons. So, yeah. yeah. And that's supposed, to, that's supposed to pay back or not yes. pay back, but at least pay for itself. Am yes. I right? Yes. I'd love to see that if that's true. Yeah, me too. Um, we will. That, I will bring you information on that. That information all comes from the contractor. Yes, and we, I am we, also tracking on our side. Um, I'm getting utility bills, and I'm doing a comparison of last year's utilities, okay. this year's. Okay. So I'm I'm okay. I'm also double checking some of those that, figures. That was my question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for capital outlay, um, what was scheduled at the beginning of the year when we revised the budget? We were transferring four hundred thousand from the general fund. 750000 from the water utility, and 450000 from the wastewater utility, and 800000 from the sewer utility, or the stormwater utility, which is a total of $2.4 million. After last meeting, um, we talked about capital projects for 2020. Those total up to be about $1.1 million, which leaves us with some cash reserves in the capital improvement fund of $1.2 million. 
And for now, I'm suggesting that we hold those dollars in that capital outlay fund for unforeseen shortfalls for the remaining of the year. And in the, in the event that we get the cost share program um, for the Horton Street project, if, it's, if that application is successful, that would also give us those matching dollars um, for, that, for that project. What, so, what, what's the time frame for us knowing that? Um, I don't know, Pete, but I can find that out and get that information to you. Okay. I can find that out. Any questions on the financials? And again, I will be bringing this to you every meeting as I have updates, um, just to make sure that our, our revenues are this where is, we think we need they be. This is appreciated. You're welcome. I know in the beginning we talked about every department cutting them, cutting their budget 15%. Yeah. Was you successful with that? Um, there's been some departments that have cut deeper than others, and I sent you um, I sent you all an email for the general fund um, just so that you can have an idea. Um, I can resend that if you want me to, um, but um, I feel like we were successful on where we were going to cut. You feel comfortable with yeah. it then? Yeah, I do. Okay. We also, Susan and I also have a plan that if things don't come back. They, Dave, you're going to have to talk loud. Susan and I already have had a plan that if things, we, we were, we we're looking at and have a plan to uh, take care of shortfalls in other areas if we have to. The next discussion that you're getting ready to have is about the pool. And so um, I, I'm just going to kind of preface that conversation with, in the event that you, you vote to open the pool for this summer, um, we will need some extra staff. Um, and that's for the cleaning and making sure that we are following all the guidelines set forth um, and what we think is necessary in order to open the pool. With that being said, it's going to be about an additional $30,000 for the, the weeks that we plan on being open. Um, per week or in total? In total. And it's hard for me to project what our numbers are going to be. So some of that could be, you know, we have a lot, an influx of, of patrons coming to the pool that might cover some of that cost. Um, so the shortfall might not be as drastic as what we think. So that's just something that we're going to have to play by ear if you choose to open the pool. And Chastity's here, and she's going to talk more about that. I'm going to let her talk, and then we can come back and have more discussions around the finances. Okay? Chastity. Good evening. Uh, some of you I know, some of you I don't, so I just want to introduce myself. I'm Chastity Ware, and I am um, a family and consumer science teacher at Jay Hawkland High School. That's what I do during the school year, and then this will be my ninth summer taking care of the Fort Scott Aquatic Center. I took care of the Mount City Swimming Pool seven years prior to coming down here. So I do have a little knowledge behind this. I feel like I do a really good job of keeping track of data and that sort of thing to bring to you each year as needed. It has been a few years since I've been at one of these meetings. Um, so I, I, on your desk, have put a kind of a note of what I wrote to the uh, Dave Bruner, Dave Martin, and Susan when I had finally had my final straw. I'm not going to lie. There were lots of days that I was not going to open this pool. I was going to fight to close it, and there were days I was going to fight to open it. And after my last meeting with the Zoom meetings that we were having with all the Kansas City Parks and Recs people, I decided I was going to fight to open this pool. So I'm not going to read word for word what this says because you're all capable of reading, but just a couple things. After speaking with Erica DeVore from the Executive Director of the Kansas Recreation and Parks Association, as well as Ted Nelson from the Hutchison Swimming Pool, who is about double in our size, but they are going to open. And he has been in uh, direct contact with Vijay, uh, from the governor's office, I think there are some things that I want you to be aware of of why I think it's important that we open this pool. So first and foremost, I think po we can post some signs to remind patrons of the social distancing. I think the most important thing we need to understand is the verbiage that is being used in these phases. So the phases that Governor Kelly has put out there says no more than 45 people in a mass gathering. For me, for the longest time, that meant no more than 45 people at any location. That is not true. They mean 45 people. So if I am having a birthday party at the swimming pool, and I walk in with 45 people, and one of my friends from the pool comes up and speaks to me less than six feet away, they have now broke the code of violation. And we are no longer staying that six-foot distancing. 
And I think that's been a misconception through this entire situation. And that was kind of the breaking point for me to say, we need to open this poll. Um, also, Governor Kelly talks about how it's important that we keep that six foot social distancing where applicable. That does not apply at the pool, according to Vijay um, from the governor's office. We don't normally have 45 people that congregate in one specific area at the swimming pool. So we would still stay within that uh, less than 45 people in that phase out time frame. Red Cross has been off and on. CDC has been off and on about whether our lifeguards should wear masks. And I'm not going to lie there either. At one point, when the masks were going to be worn by our lifeguards, that is a safety hazard. CDC and Red Cross has now came back and said no lifeguard should wear a mask. That is a hazard, as I just mentioned. We would like to have a few sanitation stations of just having some gel of some sort, um, antibacterial gel. Uh, we will recommend that our office personnel and concession stand people will wear a mask and our deckhand that will do our cleaning throughout the day will wear a mask as well. We will not be putting our lounge chairs out. That is just one more thing for us to have to clean. So we have a higher cost there of constantly needing to clean those. We are going to ask that people bring their own chairs or just use the concrete um, with their towels. Um, we could also recommend not having the three o'clock and five o'clock break like we normally do. And the reason for that would be that's less option for people to congregate in a specific area by not having those breaks. And according to the newest information from the Kansas Rex and Park Association, outside pool need 36 square feet per person. So our numbers may need to be smaller to begin with. As Dave Bruner and I have talked about, though, if we wait and not open the pool until June 22nd, we don't have to worry about that. But if we could go ahead and incorporate that maybe the first week or so to kind of keep our patrons a little more safe. So again, just my last couple words here would be that I just want to remind, because this is something that was on my mind about do we open, do we not open? And <clears throat> I want to just make the point that coming to the pool is an option. Nobody's required to come. So if they're worried about, you know, getting the COVID or whatever that case may be, then they don't need to come. I think there's some stipulations that we're going to have to put into play, and I apologize, I don't have this for you, so I'm just going to read them, that I would love to share with the community once we finalize if this is going to pass to open. But the pool is an option. It's not a requirement to come. Uh, we would practice our six-foot distances whenever possible. If you don't feel good, we want you to stay at home. Practice hand washing and good sanitation at all times. We would recommend, I recommend, that no passes are sold that we do a daily, uh, what's my word, rate, daily rate every day versus passes sold. And the reason I say that is if we happen to have an outbreak in this community, we then have to turn around and either re reimburse or somehow put a credit, and that's a nightmare. So if we just do a daily rate, we can avoid that. Uh, we will really incorporate and ask for their cooperation for following the rules uh, now more than ever. <clears throat> Reminders of no flotation devices. This is a big thing for people that come out of town. They don't like not having to be able to have flotation devices and that they would just bring their own chairs. I'm sure we can add some more things to that list as well. And I'm sure you have some questions for me. So I'll open it up to you at this point um, if you have any. But I, I've got, I'm sorry. Can I, may, yeah. can I jump in? I've, I think I, I, I still need clarity on the 45 people. So you're telling me there could be three groups of 45 or four groups of 45 as long as they stay within their own group? Correct. Now, uh, once they break apart, they are no longer that part of that 45 and, but, mass grouping. Okay. And they're if they're saying, not in the water, then those 45 people in each group are expected to stay six feet apart. I'm sorry, repeat that? Okay. And any individual within, within their 45 person group, if they're not in the water, would be expected to stay six feet apart. Are they going to social distance when they're on, on land, so to speak? Not the, not the group that's with the 45 people. They do not have to. And, and by phase, by the phase out of June 22nd, there are no restrictions. Okay. So Randy, this, they're when saying I wrote if this, this was according to if we were going to open June 15th. Right. Randy, they're saying that if you have a group of 40, you can have a group of 45 people in the same area that are not social distancing. Okay. So that's, that's what I they're just, calling a mass gathering. That. So, how, so how many total people could we? Our pool capacity, if I remember correctly, is 400. And we, we have done 400 before, and it is a nightmare. So my recommendation would to be start that at about 250 and maximize that at 300 for the first week or two just so we can see where we're headed with this. You know, I think okay. this has been. Go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of specific questions. Sure. That's okay. Uh, so, and is, is there any concern about contact transfer on things like slide? I don't even know what it's in the slides or water wheels. The or, water is has the chlorine uh, parts per minute or part. Say, am I saying that right? Parts per minute um, that has the chlorine that is required that kills it or does not allow it to be transferred that runs through the slide. Seems to be a lot of confusion about that, but okay, okay. Uh, and if you're talking about single use passes, which I'm all for, I think that's a great idea. Are, are we going to allow them to social congregate at the window to buy tickets, or is that also going to be? They'll just do their room? daily, and that's where we will have extra personnel that will stand out there and ask them to spread out. We'll probably have to put some type of tape or something down. And we really only have that for about the first 10 minutes that the pool opens. That might be a little different this year, but we are ready to tackle that if needed. Okay, so I would just like to state that I've talked to several people in other in other communities. Um, the city manager in Nevada, he asked me, we were speaking one day, and he asked me if we're opening our pool because they're not opening their pool. We've decided not to open ours, and I sure hope you do because a lot of people in our community are praying and hoping that you guys open the pool so they can come use it. Several citizens in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Jeff, is that what's wrong with that? Are you talking to me? No, no I was talking to Jeff. He started laughing. I thought Tim was funny. I'm you. agreeing with you because I've heard all these same conversations. That's a funny so. statement. Oh, okay. Well, and now that's that's why I want to finish my speech is because that was Nevada I was talking about. And then my friends in Pittsburgh have all been calling relentlessly saying, please open the pool. Please open the pool. We'll be there the whole time. If we're thinking we're going to lose $30,000, which is true, we may lose $30,000, the thing we need to consider is the golf course loses thousands and thousands of dollars a year. Am I right? And we open it every year. This swimming pool is something that everyone in this community has not only used, their kids have used. We've all grown up with that old swimming pool. Now we got the new swimming pool. We built it for a reason. It helps keep the kids off the streets. Am I right, Travis? If you keep just a couple of kids from being ornery during the day, or they might be ornery at the pool for all I know, but if you keep a couple of kids off of drugs, off of all kinds of things, and you've done your due diligence as a leader of the community, I think that these girls run a tight operation. I know several people that are employees at the pool, and, and I think we'll make that money back several fold in the in the sales tax dollars because these people don't just come here and swim they're going to stop and eat and they're going to see the new dollar tree and they're going to they're going to shop around they're going to use our facilities so i think this is a great thing that we if we don't capture this they might even think you know what i'm renting an apartment in pittsburgh i might as well move to fort scott because they got a swimming pool um also i wanted to say that um I, I think I said it all. I think I said it all. The thirty thousand doesn't bother me. I mean, Kevin, I think that the other cities close their pool too early. That's what. If you would have listened when they first, and that's where we were. It was like, oh my gosh, look at all what you're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. And I think they made the decisions to close now. Again, they may have made it financially and just said. And I made that comment to them at the couple of meetings that we had that I truly believe a lot of the pools close their pool prematurely. Bottom line. Um, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little nervous that we're going to have a lot of people from other communities, but I'm also, I'm ready for it. Let's, That's great. I mean, I am. Um, and I think I have a what wonderful a way, staff. Great that way to sell our community. So. Well, and it goes back to, if, if uh, I can assume that, well, there will probably be comments that, well, we're having all these people from outside of our community and doesn't that get kind of scary, you know, and worrisome with the current situation. However, it's your choice to go to the pool. It's your choice to go out and, and, and utilize that. And if you do, take the precautions necessary um, to stay safe uh, for you and your children. So, um, yeah. I, I take I a agree. different approach on that. I mean, I'm just a small town kid. I ain't seen a lot of people, you know, really sick over this deal in these small communities. That was a big deal in big cities. And, you know, it, it's helped cripple us as a, as a community and financially. And, and I say it's time to get back on the horse as long as we do it in a decent manner. Manner, We need to, we need to get going. We need to jump out in front of this and, and get it on. The, so do we need to call path. a question? And I, I would actually have a couple more specific oh, okay. questions for it. That, that, that's okay. Because uh, we're uh, call a question. We're, we're actually going to hear the financial impact of this too, aren't we? It's 30000 Actually, that, that's it. I can't tell you okay, so revenues. So I, 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 I actually, you and I have a little more paranoia about the disease and our responsibility for spreading it to the world. But, but, but I eat a lot of hot dogs. Despite that, um, I, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and in favor of with these, with these uh, 
but I want to understand. So uh, you have the capacity after June the 22nd to have full, so your, your capacity in the pool would uh, accommodate people from outside the community. Uh, our capacity is 400. Well, I mean, are you ever full from our own kids? No. Okay. No, we on an average are about 100 to maybe 200 max, and that's on an extremely hot day, maybe the middle of July. But normally, no, we are in the 100 to 150 range on a regular basis. And the is, only time we've ever hit the capacity of 400 is the radio pool parties, and they're a nightmare. Yes. Susan, <laughs> They're fun, but they're a nightmare. <laughs> Susan, I know I've mentioned the golf course a couple times, and I use the golf course. How much money do you know on the average do we lose a year on the golf course? I can't roll that off. I don't have that in front of me. It's over 100. So, yeah. so if we lost 100,000, should we, should we shut it down too? I mean, that's the question I, I need to ask. I mean, because we're going to lose 30000 at the swimming pool. We might as well save triple the money and shut the golf course down, too. I, I don't think anybody's objecting to the, the understanding the loss of the money. And is, is there a motion to open the pool? I'll make the motion to open the pool. On June 22nd? Tomorrow. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> whenever, the, whenever, whenever the boss lady says, oh, I'll make the motion to open the pool. 2021. It'll be great. <laughs> no. <laughs> I would second. What what date? Twenty second, right? This uh, year, yes, mm -hmm. twenty twenty. With the stipulations that the first couple of weeks we're going to hold at, we're going to be a little more cautious. How okay. about that? That's the word I'd like You're to giving, use. We're going to be so a little you more need cautious. To give us meaning chastity and us Susan us the, to make sure that we the first couple of weeks we keep it at mm -hmm. below the four hundred to see Absolutely. how it all works. Yes. Absolutely, that's that's well within your job duties to make sure that those. St steps are taken. I, I would like to uh, ask the question. Uh, you know, the 22nd is three weeks away. away. That's, that's three weeks of these kids' summer gone. Uh, why do we... Uh, is there a need to wait until the 22nd? There is. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, and we have on purpose drug our feet because we were not sure we were going to open the pool. And in order to get the pumps, the chemicals, the prep of the pool to be ready takes right at three, sometimes even four to five weeks, depend on, depending on how much work Dave puts into that. Um, so thank goodness I'm out of school now that I can also start putting some time in there as well because he usually does it all by himself. But we'll yeah, I really that. wanted it June 15th, but because of the, you know, the prep work, we really need those three weeks. Yeah, and okay. we were really pushing to get out of the phase out time frame, yeah. so we did not have any more stipulations. Yeah, so that was our biggest reason as well. Okay. So, Chastity, we appreciate the work that you have put in, as well as Dave and Susan, um, the work that um, you've put in on this as um, lots, we all get comments from people in the community, how important it is to get it open, how much that they want to abide by your safety rules. So. Um, I just, having been involved in your meetings and stuff, I just wanted to thank, thank you, you. Um, all of you for the work that you did on this to help this get this accomplished for our community. Thanks. I appreciate it. You ready for roll? Yes. Yes, I am. Lindsey Watts. Yes. Randy Nichols. Yes. Pete Allen. Yes. Kevin Allen. Mm, yes. <laughs> JoLynn Mitchell. Yes. All right, next uh, we have consideration of sale of city. Sorry. Uh, we got to, we Sorry. Got I just want to skip in here just a second. And this this is kind of goes in with the sanitation and the cleaning of the pool. Um, a few, two or three weeks back, um, the state announced a federal coronavirus emergency supplement funding grant program. Um, it's about $5.9 million that was allocated to the state of Kansas to provide funding for prevention, preparation, and the response to the coronavirus. Um, this wasn't a match requirement. We looked at a few things um, that it could be used for, and I wanted to focus on cleaning supplies. Since this virus, you have all different kinds. Pete, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I'll scoot in just a little further. All different kinds of cleaning supplies, um, ones that last 90 days, ones that – so we looked at different things, and we found a – called a SAO system. It's a stabilized aqueous ozone system. Basically, it takes O2 oxygen and adds another molecule and makes it O3. What we did was we applied for that grant, and we did get um, the notification today that we did receive that grant for $12,201. And 
And what we're going to use that for is we're going to put these systems in Fire Station 1, Fire Station 2, and our EMS building. And we can also utilize it in the pools, in, in Buck Run. Basically, um, if they have a gallon jug or five-gallon jug or spray bottles, they want to come in there. Um, it runs through a water system, so they can just fill them up. They can use them for 24 hours, and then it turns back to water, so they just dump it out. So wow. it's a win-win for us. We got the grant to put that in, and also it'll hopefully um, cost effective on our budget for cleaning supplies, general cleaning supplies. So I just wanted to yeah. let you know that. Good job. Thank, yeah. Thank you for doing that. Okay. Um, back to the sale of two pieces of property that we talked about last week of selling. Um, we can either do the sealed bid or we can I, – I met with – when Commissioner Allen said that Justin Meeks handled it for the county, I met with Justin, and Justin would be glad to handle selling these two pieces of property uh, in a bid situation, auction situation on the county uh, steps on a Saturday morning. Um, so if we, it's up to you. If you want us to set a date for the um, auction, we'll be glad to meet with Justin and do that. Uh, we have some signs made up and pictures of the properties, two pieces of properties that we're talking about. Uh, or we could go through the sealed bid, and Diane, those have to be out 30 days. So, what would be the date that if they decide to go the sealed bid? Um, I don't have a calendar in front of me. Okay, well, it'd be 30 days from today. It, well, we'd have to advertise it, so okay, we probably wouldn't be able to get it in until Saturday's paper. Okay, so, so 30 days from that date, probably 30 days from uh, no, July 6th. So it's totally up to you. I have an avenue that won't cost us anything, and Justin would be glad to do it. He did it, does it with the county uh, property, um, and um, so it's totally up to you. Just let us know how you want to get rid couple of this property. A couple of questions, Dave. Number one, are we going to be selling more property also? I mean, some people have said, why are we just selling these two properties? Is that something that we're going to be entertaining here in the near future is unloading some more of these properties that we own? Well, now I will take that responsibility over, and there is quite a bit of work that has to go through to prepare the property, but we do have property that need, we need to start getting rid of, so yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, we have a, a, a ton of property around the lake, um, a ton of properties in town, a, a ton of properties in general that we're getting no use out of whatsoever besides maintenance. Um, so I think this is a, this is a great start. Um, the first thing I would say is, um, in visiting with some uh, local auctioneers, every local auctioneer, I called him and talked to him. And um, he, Justin, and, and I appreciate him offering to do it for us for free. But when I think about this, in, in my mind, um, if you know, I went to the tax sale because I'm the one that told you about Justin doing the auction. And when I go to, a, to an auction, I've never heard anybody say, well, you give $1.00. Will you give two dollars? Will you give three dollars? It could be as simple as that, but you know when you go to an auction and people get excited and they start bidding and things of that nature, that's when money starts rolling. Um, that's a real deal. And and one of the auctioneers, one auctioneer I talked to said, not interested, retired. The other auctioneer said not interested, um, and the third auctioneer mentioned that he would do it for a, a very minimal price. And um, you know the, the the question I have is we had no problem paying. Um, and we're talking small money here. Um, you know, the appraisal value, when we paid the appraiser, we didn't worry about going out for bids on appraisers and things of that nature. We went to one person. We said, get us a price on what this thing's worth. Um, and they gave us a price. Um, you know, that might have been an area where you get two different appraisals and see, you know, is are these appraisals comparable? Am I right? Um I mean, I, I think so. All I did I'm, was try to get it to Z. I just I'm just picturing if, yeah, yeah I, I understand. If you want to go, if you, if you want to, yeah, it's totally up to you. I didn't talk to any, I just talked to Justin. He talked because it was mentioned and that was easy and, and. Well, I think in. If you want so are you saying you want us to use an, the engineer? You, all I'm doing is this. All I'm doing is, in, in all fairness, we have local businesses that we try to support. You know, people walk in here and they and they want money to plant trees, and we help them out by giving money to plant trees. We try to help all our local businesses, and and, and I think it's one of those type of deals to where at least we may possibly go out to bid on it, and then that way when the bids come back in and we say, whoa, this is way too much money. It's not worth it, you know, because they can also – those type of uh, individuals and those businesses know how to advertise and things of that nature to – 
say draw a crowd or what, whatever the thing may be. But that would be that would be what I would suggest is that we talk to some local auctioneers. I mean, even even Justin, um, great that he volunteered, but when he sold uh, an estate that he sold here lately, he didn't do it himself. He hired the local auctioneer company, and the local auctioneer, huh? For the county? He no, for oh. his father's estate. He hired the local auctioneer to go rattle it off because he can't do it. If you guys decide so. to go the auction route, I'll talk. It, it, you just need to decide whether you're going to go seal bid or auction. And I'll, My point yeah. is this. I bought and sold several pieces of property, probably 50. And and I know methods to the madness. And we can't. I don't believe we can do this with just a real estate company, can we? can put it out for real estate and then... you got to go through the process of picking right. real estate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think this... You're left with two options. You're left with a sealed bid. You're left with the auction. And it's up to you guys what you do. But I'm thinking if I sold my house, I would not say we should probably take sealed bids to sell this property. Dad's passed away. Let's just take sealed bids. Dad, When dad passes away, they load up all the tractors, all the pliers, all the knives, all the hay bales, and they sell it on the ground. So that's I, how they do it. And, and I'm sorry. I just... I, I don't really have a strong preference either way. I'm just confused about how we. If there's just there is a single auctioneer available, or we're going to put that out to bid. I kind of got lost in that. We would have to. I'd have to get if we're going to do it. We'll put it out for bid so that the other ones can decline, or um, yeah. and then come up with the auctioneer. Because there might be an out of town yeah. bid that's within that. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, sure. let me ask you this. That being said, if we're doing it legal, like you can spend less than five thousand dollars. Am I right? Yes. So if it's less than five thousand dollars, wouldn't you have the option to hire someone? Yes. But it's so still really don't it's zero dollars. Is that um, that was my understanding from last time? So that's really the question, I guess, to me I in thought, my head. I thought we were trying to do it, for, but anyway, that, that's neat. It, you just need to decide tonight. In my mind, are you going to go seal bid or give me uh, the direction to get rid of it with an auction? I, my question, you know, that was my my point was. You've got the option to spend under five thousand dollars, and I'm telling you, I'm not going to give you the guy's number. He 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 told me what it was, but you, it would be, I believe, within your best um, authority to visit with the guy and say, "Wow, I didn't know we was talking this kind of scratch." You know, let's pull the trigger on this deal. Again, the problem gets to be we're we're only going to we are going to go and select a person or we or we it seems to me that okay, we he have, would have to go out for bid, bid and then, and then they would have to officially if they, they we can give Dave the power to select the bids if we let me to. right yeah let me okay so that being said that's a great point let me ask you this Dave have you ever hired uh, someone let's just do an example uh, to landscape the the side of the building over here did you make a decision and hire somebody to do it and what did that cost Right. But I'm just saying that happens. That happens on a daily. And we're talking low money. It, it, you know, it's, it it's is low money, guess. but um, I'm recalling in a meeting that we had before that we didn't want to give authority for an emergency decision. So why do we want to give? I mean, that doesn't make good sense to me why there's, there's a pretty good difference there, but. In the past, have we not done the sealed bid process, or what's what is it that we usually do for this? I don't know. That we've sold a lot of property. It's been sealed bid. We've done yeah, sealed, sealed bid. bids. <coughs> we've done sealed bids before. It doesn't matter to me any either well, way. Well, the, the only reason I bring it up, I keep going back to this yeah. point, is that our initial conversation this meeting was that we had offended uh, people who were available mm -hmm. to to do the auction process. And so if we go out and unilaterally select somebody without giving the other available people an opportunity to participate, doesn't that put us back in the same situation we were sure. in? Sure. Uh, I agree. Let's go out for bids. I mean, I, I think that's great. I'm just my, – my point was being that we spend under or five – you can use Justin. I mean, Justin said he would do it. I mean, it just – yeah, it doesn't – I'm just saying that you, your decision needs to be do you want to use seal bids where nobody sees – I, I've had a lot of dialogue about this property, I, I, and there's there's some I, concern about auctioning and who wants it and hey. all this stuff. And I'm just, you know, sealed bids means that you don't know the identity, you know, got the minimum, and you open. I, the, I can't hear you, Dave. Please. Sealed bids just means you you've got a minimum, and you're going to set a time, and you're going to open them, and there's no questions 
who saw what, who did what, who bid people. And, well, and it doesn't make a difference to me. I'm just saying that it, it, or you, have th you have three options. You can either do sealed, you can use Justin, or give me the uh, – have us go out for an auctioneer. Now, Jeff, would we – if they gave me the authority to go ahead and set the auction, I could just – get open the bids and set the auction date and get it done right that's the main thing i want to get this done i think we're, as long as we have we're meeting our, our purchasing guidelines if you're within your authority that they give you then i think you're fine um you know just making a decision is going to be the thing you gotta, gotta pick a direction and go so my point is, again, being we're discussing this, you said that the, you feel like the sealed bid process is easier because there's no questions, there's no nothing, it's all in an envelope, there's no chance to do anything weird. Why is there a chance in a, in a public auction to I'm do something weird? There is. I'm, saying that, I'm not saying there is. I'm just saying that... That's the I've, feedback you've gotten. Is that so, that's what you're trying to say? So I've, I've experienced both, uh, and I've been to more auctions than I ever should have been. And I have a 60 by 100 garage to prove it. It's ridiculous. But the point is, is that I've been to both type of atmospheres, and I've got great deals on sealed bids, and, and, and I've took a hit on sealed bids. I've done both, but, but the, the, the live auction is always the real money. That's always exactly what that thing's worth that day. When you're standing on the street, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just when you're standing on the street, and you say the last bid is fifty thousand dollars. That's what that thing's worth that day. There's no, there's no questions on the, on the as far as sealed bids goes. I mean that's, and I think what we can do tonight is that we can let Dave uh, give him the uh, the chance to go out and get bids. Go ahead and put it out for bids. Let them come back, and then we look at the numbers and we say we'd rather do it for free for Justin or from Justin. And, we, and I do appreciate him offering that for free. But again, I will reiterate. That you know, there the uh, an auctioneer would be able to help you with methods of advertising, no doubt, and things of that nature. That they are that's their professional world. That's what they do. They know how to draw a crowd. They know how to make things happen. Uh, okay, if I can't put together what you just said, I I would move that we go out to bids for an auctioneer, and that we give Dave the within his uh, authority to hire one of the bids come in within a range that's within your spending line. limit. You go ahead and get it scheduled. Yeah. Jeff, my question is, if you go for auction and they sell it, can it doesn't have to come back to the commission. I can just go ahead and get rid of the property without their permission, right? Because that question was asked me, and I said, I don't know. Yeah, if they authorize, if you're authorized to dispose of the property by auction, then there shouldn't be a, another requirement to accept the bid. You're, you're, you're delegated to the auctioneer the ability to sell the property on behalf okay. of the city. Please right. sell. I feel like the question, uh, I know there's a question on the floor. I feel like the point that needs to be made, or the point of contention that the commission needs to decide is if it's under $5,000, Dave has the right, and we're giving him the authority with this vote if, if we move forward and everybody agrees and uh, Randy's motion passes then we are giving Dave the authority to spend five thousand dollars on an auction I do not believe that that is the smartest decision looking at the minimum bid is only seven hundred and fifty or seven thousand sorry seven thousand five hundred for one of the properties I don't think it is fiscally smart to spend the city's tax doll or the city's dollars that way. If I mean, are we moving forward and saying that this is going to be our process for the future? I, um, I can answer 000. that. Hey, I can answer that. It's going to be it's going to be way lower. Um, first of all, second of all, um, that's why I said give Dave the authority to go get the bids and then bring them to us. But and if they're under five thousand, then he has the authority to. He go has ahead the authority to spend under five thousand on anything he wants right. any day, any day of the week. He can go spend five thousand dollars on anything he wants. So, and we trust him to do that. And I think Dave's going to make good decisions. I trust in him that he's not going to pay five thousand dollars for an auctioneer. You will have questions to answer then, I'm sure. But I'm telling you, that is that is not going to happen. This is. And these guys are these guys are good people. They're people of our community, right? And they do the right thing. They 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 do a free auctions for schools and things of that nature for ball clubs for things that you know those type of things. But there's no reason that they should do an auction for free for the city of Fort Scott when they paid their taxes and they're a local business. 
local businesses need money to survive. So, Dr. Nichols, did you finish your motion? I think. And did we have a second? Second. Pete Allen. Yes. Kevin Allen. Yes. Lindsey Watt. Yes. Randy Nichols. Sure said no. <laughs> yes. Joanne Mitchell. Yes. Can everybody hear me okay? So Pete, far, can you hear? Okay, so, good. So far, you just stay close. I'll try. Just remind me if I get to wander. I will. <laughs> Uh, last Friday, we received two sealed bids on the remaining concrete work uh, over on the Andrew Street project, consisting of 400 foot of standard concrete curb and gutter, 100 foot of spill type concrete curb and gutter, two ADA compliant handicap ramps, two standard driveway concrete entrances, one standard four foot cross gutter section, and 48 square foot of driveway apron. Uh, like I said, we received two bids, one from a local company, Rogers and Sons Concrete, totaling $23,680. The second bid we received was from Build It LLC out of Nevada, Missouri, totaling $23,956. Could you repeat that first amount again? I'm sorry. From the local, could you repeat the first amount? The total? Yes, $23,680. Thank you. The second from Build It out of Nevada, Missouri is $23,956. Very close. Uh, we do have the money available to accept this bid, and I am going to ask you guys tonight to accept the low bid from Rogers and Sons Concrete and allow us to work with them to get the remaining concrete on the Andrick Street project done and finished up. Um, so a point of contention for a lot of these projects that we've done is having some sort of a, an agreement that um, something happens with the job. Um, and just making sure that we're covered as the city and um, have we done any work with this company? Oh, yes. Before? We've worked with them in the past before, yes. And it's all lined out in the, the specs and everything that we worked with Pete to get sent out. Wonderful. And there's a uh, performance bond required? We actually waived the performance bond because we were not going to get any, uh, we were not going to receive any bids on a project this small. Um, it seemed nobody could get a bond in that amount. So, so in substitution, I have asked for 5% and a cashier's check for us to hold. So that's what we're doing in, in lieu of the performance bond right now. Because they couldn't get any, no, none of the bond companies wanted to write it for that, that small of an amount. Is that, uh, uh, Mr. Jeff, is that... Legal is that is it in in our? Uh, <laughs> Can you hear me all right, Pete? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, obviously, we prefer the performance bond, but if if what they're telling us is nobody's going to be able to get a performance bond for that amount, given the low amount of the bid, then you know I guess we have strict adherence to our procedures meant we wouldn't be able to get anybody to do it. So we're going to have to do something. And then what they're basically asking you, if you vote yes tonight, is to approve the substitution of the um, holding of the 5% for the cashier's check, which is the amount of our of our, our retainage, uh, in lieu of the performance bond, because nobody, uh, it appears, no one's able to get one. Um, the point of the performance bond is to make sure they do the performance. And if we have something that's substantially similar, you have the power as a board to, or as a commission, to uh, to modify your rules to meet what happens on a particular question. It sounds like in this case, it's a business decision for you guys. If you, it, they're telling us that nobody can get a bond, so we either believe them or, or we don't. So you got choices on that. But Multiple companies. It, doesn't, are it certainly doesn't break the law or create any sort of criminal liability or anything. It is simply a matter of we have our rules, and if for some reason our rules make performance impossible, we have a choice. We either change our rules or but, uh, do that in an open manner like this uh, to allow this to happen, um, or we don't. And that's the, that's the question before you. Was it told to every company before the bid process that there would be no bonding demanded? I would make a motion to accept the low bid from R2 Concrete. No, this Rogers. Rogers. Or, sorry. Rogers, Rogers and Sons. Sons. Sorry. Um, of 23680 I'll second that. 
Randy Nichols. Yes. Lindsey Watts. Yes. Kevin Allen. Yes. Pete Allen. Well, based upon my statement earlier, uh, if it has to do with spending money, I got to say no. JoLynn Mitchell. Yes. Diane, I think you're up next with the Lake Advisory Board member selection. Okay, on the Lake Advisory Board, we had um, Marcy Myers, who is serving on that. She has resigned. So we had four letters of interest received. One was from Josh Jones, Michael Hoyt, Deborah McCoy, and Judy Warren. You all have copies of each one of those in your packet. So we just need to appoint one individual to fill Marcy Meyer's spot, and hers was a spot, a position at large. Yeah, uh, doesn't own, right. doesn't own property at the lake. Correct. It's li within the state limits, right? Or does I it can be? I don't think it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are was, we gonna? Oh, go, ahead, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Joan. Are we gonna like vote like we did last? Not like uh, how we took a tally. Is that the best way to do it? Or I. I was actually at the lake meeting. Um, I'm on the lake board, and we had a lot of good discussion that day. Uh, and one of the things that was brought up was this issue of filling the the uh, position. Um, Nancy Mays and uh, Nancy Van Etten and and all of them, we pretty much came to a general consensus uh, that day. And, and there's a lot of good. Every one of them on there is good people. And, and I know I'm really glad that they wanted to be a part of something like that. But they thought that this would be a good position for Deb McCoy. Uh, that was their wishes. And I told them that I would carry that to the meeting. So that was what was said at the lake uh, meeting. Discussion? Has there been a motion made? No. No, you don't think nope. We're just voting. Oh, we're just voting. That's right. We're just voting or are we making a motion? Whatever you want to do. Well, what they're I mean, asking is, do we go off where we did like we did last time, or can they just nominate somebody? I think that's what they're asking. I think we can make a motion. I'm not an attorney, but I feel yeah, like if, I know like a lot. That's a lot of people's court. Yeah, if you make, if you make the motion, if the, if the rest of the board doesn't want to do it, or the commission doesn't want to do it, I'll tell you. I mean, that's. that's I make the motion. Deb McCoy is the new board member on the late committee. Second. Randy Nichols. Yes. <laughs> Lindsey Watts. Yes. Kevin Allen. Yes. Pete Allen. Yes. JoLynn Mitchell. Yep. All right. Next, we have an interlocal agreement with Bourbon County. Susan, I think that's you. Um, we've had several discussions with the county about using um, an interlocal agreement to get several different items, um, asphalt, rock, um, some storing of our salt product um, at their facility. And I think it was in the packet, the agreement. They actually approved the agreement this morning, and I'm just asking for you to approve that as well. We've put a cap um, on the amount that we will be able to exchange. Um, they have EMS services that they pay us um, to administer. And so that cap is at 400000 which is about the amount that we do the transfer to the streets program. So I kind of left it at that amount. Um, if, if there needed to be um, a change at some point, then we can um, look at that agreement going forward. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Is there a downside to it? What do we need to be? No, we're actually saving you, money by doing this. Yeah, I just need to be educated about risk, yeah. risk and benefits. Uh, that might be a Jeff question. I don't think that there's... Oh, I'm not talking about legal risk and benefits. I'm talking about... Cost. I mean, it may be a Jeff question. Um, Cost-wise, we are going to save half on rock um, because of the rock crusher that they have. Yeah, what are we talking on rock? Four bucks a ton? Mm -hmm. Versus you, eight. Yeah, you run to the query and it's, well, it's $8.65. Mm -hmm. I get bills quite frequently for it plus tax. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the cheap tax. rock. That's AB3. Oh, I think yeah. you guys have probably heard that type of rock mentioned here in the city commission room. That's oh. AB3. And then you got one inch clean. They've got all kinds of rock out there that we're going to be able to have access to. So you're going to save half the money on it. Right. And Chad, am I right? You guys buy rock from time to time. 
uh, possibly put some in some alleys and things of that nature that might need it. So this is going to be a great thing. And we're also partnering with them um, to lay asphalt for us, um, borrowing equipment as needed. It's just a very good partnership, I think, between our public works um, departments. Well, this is a, yeah, this is a great thing. This is what one of the things that I know myself ran on was getting along with the county. And, and you know, we've I've been talking for several months with uh, with all the county commissioners and with James, and they've been very easy to get along with. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying that you know that could last forever who knows but but it's working right now and i believe chad you probably have some equipment over there right now on andrick street right okay yep so it's working out great i would make a motion to enter into the agreement in our interlocal agreement with the county bourbon county Second. <laughs> lindsey watts yes kevin allen yes pete allen Yes. Randy Nichols. Yes. Joanne Mitchell. Yes. Uh, Jeff, you're next with the Code of Ethics. Okay. Um, at the request of several of the commissioners, as, as I briefed you about last meeting, um, there was a question as to two sorts of uh, codes or a procedure or a code of ethics. Um, first, we're going to talk about is the code of ethics and second is the code of procedure. And I want to give you the format for this is going to be that we're going to talk about it tonight, but we're not voting on necessarily on it tonight. What we're going to do is talk about it because we need to get input from everybody who's a stakeholder. That would include all the commissioners in this room, um, staff, um, and, and the public for that matter to get input on what we're, what we're looking at. Why do you need... Um, I'll talk about both of them, and then we'll get into the specifics. Why would you need a code of procedure or a code of ethics of any kind? Well, um, we represent, at this point, uh, about 40-odd communities, and as I think we've seen in our meetings here, um, in a lot of ways, this if you don't have a, an agreed set of rules to work with, it is very difficult to get anything done. And you know, a lot of times people can agree on the rules, but the time you need the written rules is when you don't agree. Um, it's one of the reasons why we don't play Monopoly in my family, because nobody can agree on the various different rules. I got my favorite rules, they got their rules, and never the two shall meet. Um, and so what we need to probably do is, the point of these meetings is supposed to be to get from, get the, the, get the efficient use of the city's resources uh, move from point A to point B. And we need to have a way to do that we all agree on. So we know when something comes up, like a motion to reconsider or if something comes up, we kind of know what to expect. And everybody knows what the rules are because there's nothing that's less fair than somebody getting by because they know a rule that somebody else doesn't know. We want to make sure everybody knows the rules. They're out there. You can look them up and we can figure it out. It also sets clear expectations for what it is that you uh are expected to do in your respective positions gives us some guidelines if you need and if you don't when i don't know what's going on when an error message goes up in my car check engine light comes on i run the meter on it i get the code i go look it up in the book and see what it says that's really no different here if we're having a hiccup in a meeting or we're having something that gets in the way of our doing the people's business there ought to be a, some reference manual to look at something to look at and say here it is in order to put these together, I looked at two sources uh, for the code of procedure, at least. The, it's called Rosenberg's Simple Rules of Parliamentary Procedure for the 21st Century, and then the, uh, the the Kansas League puts out a code of procedure for Kansas cities. And both of those are are made for bodies of our size. The most famous one you might hear about is Robert's Rules of Order. We have one city that's adopted that. It's a nightmare for things of this size. Um, if you've got 435 folks in a House of Representatives, it might be your way to go. But for five folks in here, it is, it's, it's terrible. Um, so I guess you want me to talk about the Code of Ethics first thing's the first one up. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, we have an existing provision in our Code uh, of code of Ethics, but it really doesn't have a lot in it. If you look at it, there's no – I mean, it, it's basically just some platitudes. And while that is good, the reason you have rules like this is to – allow them to be enforced. And what I did was I went and looked at some of our other cities that have had problems and looked at what they used, uh, not only their initial rules, but what did they change their rules to after they had a problem that wasn't able to be addressed. And so that's where I got with this code of ethics. And I've divided it up into, you know, the first part is an introduction, which is just a general statement of why it is, why we do what we do. And then we talk about 
three areas of concern, how commissioners conduct themselves with one another, so how you guys, you know, whether you play well with others. Uh, the second, so the, the section three is uh, how, how commissioners uh, work with the public uh, and, and vice versa, how the public works with you. Uh, section four is how commissioners conduct themselves with other boards and commissions. We've appointed some boards and commissions here, um, subservient boards and things, Lake Advisory Board and Streets Commission. Um, and we need to sort of know how that relationship works. And then um, finally, how the commissioner uh, works with the city manager and the subordinate staff here. Cities, are, it's a unique type of construction. We talked about this when I gave the training back in February. Um, you guys, the commission is the board of directors, basically, if we look at this as a sort of like a corporation. You guys set the policy, the overarching principles, and you hold everybody to account. And that's that's on, on this end of the scale. And then by statute, the city manager is, is uh, empowered with the day-to-day -day administration of the government and the, uh, the running of the day-to-day -day operations in the various divisions and the, the hiring and firing and that sort of stuff with your advice and consent. So the question comes, what happens when that relationship isn't working well? Um, because we are going to have conflict. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, how do we manage that conflict? And it sets some expectations for both the staff, um, the directors, the appointed and the elected folks to sort of know, you know, what, what should I do and how should I go about doing it? And then uh, towards the end of this, um, I, I broke out city staff member conduct with commission and then commission members' uh, concerns with staff. And then right at the very end, uh, there is a sort of a, a set of, um, on page seven, some, uh, it finishes up on page seven, some sort of what do, you, what do you do and how do you do it sort of stuff. So I'm going to ask you to look through these and, and take a look at them and see how they would apply in your your day-to-day -day operation of your job as a commissioner. And there should be things in here that help you do your job more effectively than ensure that when you have to give bad news to somebody or someone has to tell you something that is bad news that you don't want to hear, that we can do that in a way that preserves everybody's um, respect for each other and for their position. I mean, I spent a little bit of time in the military, and the deal there was, if you always watch Band of Brothers, you salute the rank. You don't necessarily, even if you can't salute the person, you salute the rank. You guys as commissioners are entitled to a certain amount of deference as commissioners because you are our ultimate bosses. But there's defined lines. Dave runs certain things. You run certain things. And we got to know as staff, we can't be in between the two of you. we got to know how this works. The kids have to have some set of order um, that so we can look at. So these ethics rules are basically aimed at doing that. Um, I don't expect you to have read all of them tonight. So if you have questions about them, I'm happy to explain various things. But my guess is you're going to have more questions for me over the next two weeks and then at the next meeting. But if you've got questions now, I'm happy to take them or I can go through them if you'd like. Jeff, I want to make on meeting agendas, and Susan's here. Uh, we tried to get the agenda out on Wednesday. We, we do it now on Friday by noon. Yeah. The problem, the problem that we run into is we could get the agenda items out, mm -hmm. but the finances. Susan, can you explain the problem? Yeah. 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 You know, we can always send that piece of the agenda mm -hmm. out separately. Um, yeah. Are you speaking of the like the ordinance? Yeah. So I, that would be that would be wonderful. Something that I I, I don't know. Uh, city staff is fairly aware of my process, um, but I as soon as I get the agenda on Friday, um, whether it be the paper or um, on our iPad, I read over it so I'm familiar with the the, the words that I'm seeing and and what the subject matter is, and then most of the time I've I've heard about it before I see it on the agenda. Um, however, I might not know every single detail and it might not be finalized yet, but I spend Monday really digging into it. And then Tuesday, I spend a good time here asking any questions that I've had or contacting people on Monday um, or, or Tuesday. Get a few extra days would be wonderful, even if it wasn't all the information, if it was more time to digest that information and also give you guys more time. I feel like I'm bombarding you on... Tuesday afternoon when you guys are trying to get ready for commission meetings and Chad, I, I tend to bombard him on Mondays um, with phone calls, but um, so, it, it would be nice. So just clear, we we would we would we would have the agenda and the items to be discussed by Wednesday at noon. Mm -hmm. But the finances, are you talking about what's on the consent, the appropriations? What would they be seeing on Friday? Um, appropriations. 
perforations is what is what would come on Friday because Janet does her final run on Friday morning, so we include all that information and then we get it designed. So we can send that out on Friday morning. And sometimes, depending on if there's a delay in payment or if we have a hiccup and when we're closing down, I may need that little bit of extra time to do financials. Yeah. Um, but if there's anything alarming, trust me, you will know well ahead of time. Right, exactly. And I, I trust that. But it, it would be nice to be able to vet or, you know, ha have a little bit more time to um, speak to directors or Dave um, or anyone about specific agenda items. So that's why I was pointing that out to Dave. Well, and that, and that gets to the procedure stuff, too. So, yeah, let's. I think what 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 you were talking about was more about the the specifics of the agenda and how we do that. And understand, this is this was my this is my basically my first draft for your consideration. I'm not married to any of these things, um, nor should you be. It's a matter of figuring it out. There's several options for us, Jeff. Is what you're but, saying? Yeah, and basically, whatever you decide, guys decide you want to do. Other cities that we have, so one of our cities has one where they're setting agenda items for for bills and ordinances you know, almost two weeks out. I mean, they're they're way out. That's out of the ordinary. And also, I think Friday, if for for even for a Tuesday meeting or a Monday meeting. Thursday and Friday is one of toward the ones that's a little too soon for most people because I'm I'm very sympathetic to it's hard for me to get up on it as well and I know that you guys all have your other jobs and other things you do and it's asking a lot to cram that in but I think we need to work on yeah, and that's the that's the type of input we need is how do we get this process down what can be available when can we get the agenda out on a on a Wednesday and if there we can always change it we're not constrained like Missouri is to being handcuffed to an agenda that has to go out at a particular time we're able to kind of we're doing this and putting it out there so that the public knows as well that's the other thing i want to bring up the agenda should also notify the public of what we're going to talk about so they can know and we have to sit through these meetings they don't they can show up for whichever meetings they want to show up for and they need to have some notice we're not required necessarily to give it to them um you know in, in terms of an agenda but they should have some notice of what's on the agenda so they know when to show up sure and, and that helps us out. So, is there is there things in these options that's going to limit our speech as uh, city commissioners? Not that it's going to not going to limit your speech, but I will tell you this: the the issue you have to remember is that when you're elected, you are more than just a private citizen anymore. So you have the ability to um, to dig the city into a hole with things you say or don't say. So you have to be very careful as a commissioner, and we've talked about this before, this is not something new to anybody, you have to be very careful because the you all have your own opinions and you're entitled to them and should be able to speak them. But you have to be very careful not to speak as if you are giving the city's official position because the city's official position may be three of you and the other two think it's entirely wrong. I know that's a foreign concept, but, you know, that – so – when the public hears you speak, they might have a hard time figuring out whether you are Commissioner Pete Allen talking to them or whether you are my neighbor Pete Allen. And there's there's a difference. So we got to make sure that when people hear us, they understand that difference. So it's not a matter that you are going to be constrained from speaking your mind. You just have to be careful that when you do speak your mind, you don't let somebody believe it's. The I found special. myself doing that a lot lately. Um, this is my commissioner hat. Yeah. <laughs> this is. This is. My I don't citizen. think you can ever take that off. Well, yeah. I, it, this is my personal opinion, but my personal uh, my commission opinion has outweighed uh, what's best for the community has outweighed my personal opinion on a few different matters so far um, because what's best for the community is. And so well, that's, that's what I mean by making that decision. That's something that's, that, that I, I deal with a lot. Sometimes forget that people don't understand this is that I, I can tell you what my legal opinion is. And I don't have to agree with that personally. I can wish it wasn't so. Right. But my, my legal opinion is driven by certain things which one of them is not, how do I feel today? Um, where my personal opinion may be driven by a lot of other things. I, you know, I have a client to serve, just like you have a city to serve. And you may find yourself in that unenviable, posi un unenviable position where you need to make a decision that you wish you didn't have to make, and that if it was just you making it, you wouldn't, you wouldn't make that decision. But as a commissioner, you might find it's the one you have to make. And that, so this is a sword and a shield to a certain degree. Jeff, I wasn't necessarily talking about in public. I was talking about in, meeting, in the meeting. Will we still be able to conduct a meeting as we do now where we have a freedom to speak as we are to you right now or will we have to ask permission, things of that nature? 
you're gonna you're gonna hate a, a, a legal answer, but yes and no, both. <laughs> um, the, the 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 role of the chair and the and the code of procedure, the role of the chair and the mayor in this case, or if the mayor's not here, the president of the commission, and if the, he's not here, then whoever you guys vote for the to be the mayor pro tem for the day is charged with running. Once we have an agenda, the law is clear, we have to follow it. So the, the, the chair is supposed to keep things moving along, keep us on task. Um, you know, and you can tell we've been talking about these things because it's like Commissioner Nichols has heard me talk about the call to question stuff. And I've, I've, I've talked about that before and it's starting to bleed into the meeting. But that is, it is, it is a valid argument that if we're getting off topic, we need to get back on topic. And not because you can't speak, but because if we're talking about something that the public wasn't on notice of, was supposed to be on the meeting, well, you know, we need to probably, we, it's not that we can't speak about it, but we need to give them fair notice and, and a, an opportunity to be heard sometimes. Um, but no, nobody's going to, yeah. nobody's going to muzzle you. But if you're getting I, off topic, the, the mayor may, you may have to ask, you may have to ask permission, Madam Mayor, may I have the floor? You don't have to be formal about it. They're not trying to make us into the House of Commons over in England, but, you know. Just you respect. To, well, yeah, exactly. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be in a perfect world. I, be I agree there should be respect 100% around this board. I don't think anybody here disagrees with that. And I think we've all been offended from one time to another. This was a, uh, this was a, a different type of, uh, of election. There's a different um, array of people up here. Mm -hmm. And disrespect has came from probably every one of us on this board at one time or another towards each other. We've all had our feelings hurt back and forth. And I think we can... You know, we can work on that and things of that nature. I don't know if we need to start changing a bunch of uh, a bunch of rules. I mean, I think we're all acting pretty civil. It's just my opinion only. Yeah. But um, you know, I just don't want the uh, if if I'm going to be squelched um, as far as having my opinion, you know, coming to the meeting and things of that nature and speaking to you like I am right now. I think that's a bad start. Yeah, and it's not, and it's not going to to prohibit you from speaking. But and I, I would point you to on the first page of the code. One of the things that stuck out in Rosenberg's, and I took this verbatim from them, which you know, it's not plagiarism because they're asking to do it, but I put it in here. It said, the ultimate purpose of the rules is to encourage open yet courteous discussion by the commission while ensuring efficient decision making, even when subjects are dedicate, delicate or tempers are raw. Uh, majority rules, but the, and the rules must enable passage of a result fashioned by the majority to reflect its position while permitting the minority to fully participate but not dominate the process while expressing their separate positions. Now that there, there's your guy getting paid by the hour or by the word to write something in, in there. That's very legal, scholarly sounding when I when I read it. But it, what it basically boils down to is we got to make tough decisions. Well, you, I say we. The commission needs to make tough decisions sometimes, and you are going to disagree. There is no way around that. If you weren't disagreeing, I'd be worried because there should be varied positions. But we gotta we gotta get the question up there. We gotta get the discussion out of the way. We gotta get the people have to speak their mind, pro and con, not take it personally, have a vote, and then move on. That's another 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 thing we have to talk about is things of finality. Once you have a in in the in the formal Roberts rules, which I don't suggest you adopt. Once you bring something up, if it gets voted down, you can't bring it up again until the next session. Well, we got a way, the, the motion to reconsider is a way to do that, but we shouldn't be hammering the same point. Once you have the vote on it, it's kind of a done deal unless something changes. And so it needs to change. Now you say until the next session. That means the next meeting, right? But we're not, we're, yeah, we're not doing, we're not doing Robert's rule of the word, but generally, unless there's a change. I mean, if you, it's not a matter of, I'm going to make you vote on this this this, uh, this particular ordinance every week until you pass it, or every meeting until you pass it. It's a matter of if you if it doesn't work one way, you got to come up with a new way to do it. If we, and it's like when you and I talk back and forth on the things we've gone over. When when there's been a pushback, we we try and come up with something else, a different way to say it, different set of set of terms, and see if people like that. If they don't, at the end of the day, they voted that down. And if there's nothing new to discuss, there's nothing new to discuss. Well, but so, still, at that, at that point in in time. If I do want to bring it up every two weeks, it shows the people that I'm still trying to do the right thing, in my opinion. Am I right? Yes, and you and you always have the chance. The, the commissioner comment section is where you should be and where you we have been for the most part making those discussions. When you have something to bring to the whole the whole body, whether it's um, you know you, a concern, I mean the typical things are like concerns. A, a, a constituent contacts me about the terrible conditions over at Andrew Street, or somebody tells me there's a light pole that's been half knocked down over off of some such and such place. That, but what we shouldn't be doing is using that commissioner comment section to pass legislation that really should be an ordinance. And that's, so we got to make sure we, because if we do that, I don't know that it's necessarily fatal that, that, that you can't 
pass something very important with so little notice, but I think it's a bad idea. We need to we need to put that thing out there so people can hear about it. You have time to consider it, and then when you when you vote, you have understood what's going on, and because that vote's going to be final um, on that right. question. That kind of goes along with also whenever the agenda item, if, if we can get some kind of a, if we can get a little bit more notice, then things can be vetted or we can do more research on our end, yeah. um, our job. And I haven't gone over the actual procedure much, but I will tell you one of the things that most places do is that on, when you're changing law or policy, you know, ordinances and that sort of thing, generally there are two readings. And it is possible to do that in the same night. But it what, it, what it's doing is like what we're going to do with this the code, these two codes. I'm bringing it up now. We're going to talk about it. This is the first time you've heard about it. You're naturally going to have questions that are come, going to come to you 10 minutes after we've stopped discussing it. And so you've got time between now and the next meeting to, to think about it, to ask questions to staff, to, to say, hey, what about this? What other alternatives? And then when it comes back the second time for a reading, then at that point we should have worked out all the kinks and we should know at that point whether it's something that we've gotten a consensus on and folks are going to be able to vote for or they're not. Uh, and then that way there's there's no you know, be surprised. It's, it's like people think about law as being a, a trial by ambush. Well, we don't really do that anymore. It, you should never you know exactly what's going to happen ahead of time. And that's what we should be striving for here as well. So nobody nobody feels like they haven't had a chance to talk. Nobody feels like they've been surprised by a piece of legislation that came out. And nobody feels like they're rushed or pressured to make a decision unless they choose to be. I mean, you can, if something happens and you aren't able to look at your agenda on a Monday of, of one meeting, well, that's, you know, we'll have to help, help you deal with that. But it needs to not be, we need to get it to early enough so you're not always forced to be, you know, sliding in here and trying to digest all this stuff as we're going through the roll call. That's just not giving you guys a chance to do your job as a commissioner. From the, from the city manager perspective, the only thing I'd ask is a lot of times you'll come and you've talked to a citizen and this is their concern or you need to have something fixed. Uh, don't wait until the commission meeting. Uh, please text me. And, and I know Kevin does a real good job texting me. Um, you know, the, the meeting when you bring those things up, you know, they could have already been fixed. And that's what I'm saying is, is feel free to call me or text me or send me an email uh, with something that needs to be fixed uh, right away or get, gather some information on it so that I can bring it to the meeting or something. Rather, uh, it would just help the process, too, from my perspective and our people's perspective. Yeah. And I would say, too, that the one of the things you're able to do is to have discussion and debate. And the rules here are very clear that, you know, you there is discussion and debate on everything unless you choose not to have it. And when you choose not to have it, it's not just three of you deciding that the other two don't get to talk. If you're going to close off debate entirely, there may be a time when you want to have. You want Why'd to you have pick the number three? Because <laughs> three of five. Oh, okay. Three of five, it's just a quorum. This is th three basic majority rules. Three right. Five. So if three if three three people want to do it, any three in the room want to do it, that excludes the other two. Um, and so this protects the ability. It, you're going to get your chance to speak if you are just determined that what they're trying to do, <coughs> the other th the other three you're trying to do, is entirely wrong. We should not. When I say we again. The commission should not be able to shut you down. You should be able to say your piece, not and not just so you say your piece, but so the people can see that you're saying your piece and representing those, those right. viewpoints. Because that. Government needs to represent not just the people who agree with us, but the people that don't. And both sides have to be heard. And but at the end of the day, majority does rule. Um, and so it, obviously, and I think that's a great thing. I mean, I want everybody here to be able to speak their piece on everything, and that's what I want to protect: is that that American freedom is that the reason the people have elected us is so we could represent them. So I want to make sure that that's you know when I read through this that we're not taking that away. Yeah. Can I ask, I mean, this, well, part of the process, I feel like I already kind of know this answer, but um, just so it's in public, mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, most cities have this, have a policy or a procedure in place, whether they have, um, I mean, we have a general policy roughly in place, but it's not specific. Um, and right, I'm sorry, I'm not yeah. wording that quite right, but uh do you understand we don't currently have a written procedure. What we have is a, a history of the way we've done things. There and there's, and there's nothing wrong with that. But just like I told you with the Monopoly example, 
everybody's clear on the house rules until they've got a different interpret interpretation and the guy next to him and I want the money that's in free parking. And everybody goes, what free parking? We don't play that kind of monopoly here. Um, and that's basically, I, I use this, uh, an example like that because that's kind of what it boils down to. And we need to, we need to make sure we all agree on what these rules are. And when new members join, they are able to get up to speed and not be handcuffed by the fact that they haven't been on for how, however long. Um, and everybody has the same set of rules we're looking at. Um, so yes, but, but you have had a policy. We've used the agenda for a number of years. We've done a number of things and that worked pretty well, but not all the time. Um, and these rules won't work all the time either, but they're, they'll be written down and they provide a way for you to do things like, you can also suspend the rules too. You can say, look, we've got something that's coming through. It's an emergency in this COVID thing and we, we'd like to go without debate and four of the five of you vote to go without debate. Okay, we can get it passed quickly. If you want to have both readings of a bill on the same night, okay, we can do that. If Susan has something that an emergency that comes up, we got to pass this thing tonight or has to be considered tonight, that can, that can be handled. But we have a way to do it ahead of time so that everybody knows what the rules are so that at the end we can argue about the important things, which are was the decision we made right or wrong, not did we follow the rule, was it fair? Whatever we do has to be fair, especially when what we're doing is a, a not unanimous. So I guess is it, I don't know if it's a fair question to ask, but it, I mean, is are, are there people on here that feels like what we're doing right now isn't fair and isn't professional? Well, fair and professional would be two different things, but I, I, I would to answer your question. I think is yes, and I would use as the example. I think one of the comments you made in a previous one about the way that the votes was being handled. I, I know you didn't. You said that, and I took that to mean. And it's a hard. And I thought, you know, you know, he's kind of right. I always start with the same person. That's kind of put you at, the, at, the, at a disadvantage. And I thought, is that really fair to have the same vote called? Now, I know that the reason why it was called that was nothing, was nothing in particular. But I also know that people that have A and Z names are very passionate about alphabetical things from the military and any other number of things. And I, I talk with Diana. We've got it written in here the kind of the way we're doing it now where it kind of rolls. We start somewhere. We move around. So you're not always stuck as the, the last vote or the first vote. And so I, I took that as an issue of fairness. Was the way we were doing it really fair to everybody? And I thought you were right, it wasn't. And so when I've, when I've looked at these rules, I start looking at the rules, and every time I found a rule in one of these things in Rosenberg that I could use, I thought, well, it'd be nice if we had this, but we don't. And it's, it's kind of unfair to yank a rule out of the box <laughs> if we don't already have something in there. Um, so I, I, yes, I think the answer to your question is yes. There, I think that a lot of the complaints people have had about amongst yourselves about the way things have worked have boiled down to maybe the rules weren't being quite so fair. We didn't all have the same set of them or the same knowledge of them. And this would make it flatten the playing field, if not make it entirely flat. I would say that um, I've had a lot of citizen comments and citizen phone calls and text messages that um, our meetings are not being ran professionally. Um, so that is, and I will, I said at the last two meetings that this is something that, um, I was going to be, I had had back and forth with Jeff about because of that. So, um, so yes, to that fair and professional. Well, and well. I, I would also say that, um, no one expects any of us here to be professional parliamentarians. Right. I mean, the closest that comes, I suppose, is maybe nail it on me if you want. I see a lot of boards do stuff, but I mean, you guys are elected not because you're professional politicians. You're elected because the people want you to get in there and do a job and be one fifth of the solution to everything that goes on in this city. So, you know, to say that something wasn't running professionally, that's just an indication we got to do better. It's not an indication that we're wrong. Right. We just need to figure out a way to run more smoothly. Cause I, I'll, I'll guarantee you, I've got cities we do this at where our three or four hour meeting, hour and a half, two hours tops. And they get the same stuff done. Right. And maybe there's a good reason why we're running four hours. Maybe there's not. If there's a way that I can help you get the same work done or better done in less time, I, I'm, I have a, a duty to suggest it. And if you choose not to do it, that's fine. I think, you know, as far as the meetings go with length of time, I, I for one, do not have a problem with. I know that it's been mentioned that, you know, these meetings are dragging on. We, we had some four and a half hour meetings. Yeah. Um, but I think there was a lot of things that, um, had, had got out that we, that we wanted to get out and some of our frustrations with the way things had been ran or so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I, for one don't want to make it a, uh, 
an issue of I don't want to spend the time in a meeting. Yeah. I mean, it's once every two weeks. Let's keep in mind. And, you know, if there's discussion that needs to be had, then I want you to talk for 10 minutes if you need to to tell me what your feelings are. And, and I, I would agree with that. And I think that one of the things I, when I was talking with Commissioner Watts earlier today about this, I said these rules of any kind, these rules or other kinds should should not, they should be content neutral. They should tell us how we go about getting someplace, not what you say. And so my, my thought is not that we, we took a four hour meeting and we deleted things that were important. My thought is these rules will ensure that if we spent four hours here in a meeting, it was because a four hour meeting was necessary and not a, not a three and a half hour meeting or two hour meeting. Because sometimes if we get out of order or off topic, we can spend a lot of time spinning our wheels on things because we're not handling it in the right order. And, or it could be handled in a better order and a better way and help us be more efficient. So that's what I'm suggesting rules like this for is to help us be more efficient. And, and maybe in that we're going to find that we actually have get more content out there as opposed to more time just arguing, you know, things that don't, in, the, in, the, in the end, the, the method that doesn't make a difference. It's the content, what you're trying to get out there, how you're trying to, what you're trying to make as a decision, not whether we've got it at the right place. And having a set of rules, we know what order to, to cover them in, and that way we can cover them that order, and hopefully nothing gets missed. Can, can I uh, jump in? Yes, sir. Madam Mayor, can I jump in to try, try to get this in more formal basis? Mm -hmm. uh, um, two things. One is, is on this code of procedures. Uh, and are getting the agenda out. And I just want to confirm with Diane that there's not any one day where she has to set her hair on fire completely to get it done. <laughs> so so we can yeah. actually, okay. All right. Actually, the pressure will be on the directors to get their paper well, out again. Yes, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, okay, well, you crack the whip for them and get it done. Yeah. It gives yeah. Diane the, the teeth. The, the second <laughs> one is, the, my second issue is a little more of a sensitive issue, and, it, and it's on the uh, code of ethics. Uh, and I've, I've read it, and I'm not sure it covers this. So I'm going to give you an example, and I, and I kind of want you to respond if, you're, if it, as, as people are reviewing this policy over the next couple of weeks, if they see, the, see this as an issue and the purpose of it. So I wrote this so I could try to get it right. And, and what I want you to know is what I said was there's a recent social media post by a commissioner on their personal site uh, that demonstrated they were ill-informed. Um, and despite that, they gave misinformation, misrepresented the facts. And they especially misrepresented the information and was derogatory as it related to specific individuals and departments. And so my question, I guess I have three questions, uh, is, is social media use going to be covered in the ethics code? Because I don't, I mean, I, I read it through. I don't remember that being there. Is this particular episode, would it uh, qualify as a violation of the ethics code, either by addition or by what we have? And, and what I don't see in the ethics code is, is what are the consequences to us if we violate it? How, how is that handled? Okay, that's... Can I, can I second that, too? I want to put something else in your mind with that Absolutely. question. Yeah, if, yeah. See, discussion's a great thing. Please, yeah. Will this code of ethics, we'll call it, mm -hmm. will that be um, followed by city employees also on public websites? Yeah, okay, loaded question. You guys are really hammering me. On this. <laughs> this is what this is what me, you make the big bucks let for. Let me let me make my disclaimer here. I'm not going to talk about anybody's. Well, I'm, I'm going to get to you, but I'm not going to talk about any specific anybody's specific post at this point. But I'm going to talk about how how that's handled under under a code because I don't want to I don't want to prejudge anybody's issues because it, to be fair, um, Commissioner Nichols' part was there's a lot of things in there that a lot of assumptions that I I don't have enough information to agree or disagree with. Yeah, that's true. I just presented so, it as as an example of exactly. my question. So, and I think it's a fair question. I just want to make sure that my answer is not you're not later going to use that answer to try and beat someone. Oh, I, I will. I'm going <laughs> to. <hold the answer. laughs> um, okay, so in terms of social media posts, I, I will I need to take another pass through to make sure. But these, this code of ethics is really doesn't matter in what necessarily in what manner in which it's expressed. Um, there's a lot of consternation right now about social media and what you can and can't do. It, it, there's free speech in this country. You all have free speech. Uh, I can't tell you what to do or not to do with your own uh, social media posts. I can simply advise you, and the code would tell you that there, you know, you you have the right to say it and the responsibility to live with the consequences. And it, it's possible that as a commissioner, you're your con the consequences, if there are bad ones, might be different than they would be if you're just a regular private citizen who's not an elected official. And, and we're not um, unfamiliar with that. You know now you've got things about how much you can own a company is in disclosures and that sort of stuff. So you are aware that there are rules that apply to you that don't necessarily apply to the guy, your neighbor down the street. 
And you got to be aware of that. The thing about this code of ethics is that we, we ask you to read it, and then you've got some place to go look so you're not flying blind. Okay, another thing, to, another thing to say, too, is this would not, when passed, it wouldn't be retroactive either. I mean, you can only kind of go forward. So we can't, you can't pass a, this rule and then go back and look somebody's, at somebody's conduct six months ago, a year ago, 1987, uh, <laughs> and, and, and go after them on that. It would be prospective only. Um, and, and we need to be careful about that. The, this code doesn't create for you any powers you don't already have. And, excuse me much diet coke um and tough questions Thank can you. we can we can and this is going to get tougher can we add this if we're doing this whole big thing can we add city employees in on this and they and i, I should answer that part first they they are in this because if you if you look at the code of ethics it says um the first part i talk about uh, excellence and performance by city commission members employees and appointed board and commission members in the city of fort scott is the best way to achieve common goal you know that sort of stuff and so it's intended that these things apply not only to it to everybody who works for and with the city even our appointed board members so if you get appointed as a uh, as a member of uh, like tonight what do we do the one for the uh, lake. the lake board okay if if that if they are, they now represent the city in some capacity. And the same thing I said earlier about you expressing your opinion and somebody being confused as to whether it's the public's position, uh, the public position or the private position applies to them. And this would be the only contact they have with government. So it, it does apply to all those. It talks about commissioners. Um, let's see. And then when you look back at, there's a whole section on, uh, commissioner's conduct with other boards and commissions. It talks about uh, what you do and how that works. And then there's the commissioner's conduct with the city manager and then the staff and city manager's conduct uh, and relationship with the commissioners. Um, and that would include all, you know, all employees. I would want to tighten it up just to see if maybe we need to do any tightening to ensure that those Commission members that aren't necessarily paid employees are also covered. I believe that they are, but you bring that up. I want to double check it. So, but the concept is this code of ethics would apply to everybody who works in or for or serves the city of Fort Scott and its government. Now, I want to clarify something. Yes, sir. Because I know what Kevin's talking about. <laughs> you do. On your personal page, <laughs> an employee or a commissioner mm -hmm. on their personal page. If they say this is not representative of the commission, mm -hmm. but this is my belief, then they're okay. I guess you could say they're okay. I, I, what, I think what, where, the, where the rub is, is we have employees that have a page and then they have a personal page. Mm -hmm. And they make it very clear that this isn't the... Um, feeling of my employer, but they say things, um, which again, if they're derogatory, that gets it. You get into that, but I'm, I, I want to clarify that that you, you can't terminate an employee because of the person. If they've clarified this is not my feeling, unless it's like I'm going to kill you or shoot you or something like that. Whoa! But um, <laughs> just got but, good. Um, there's a there's a fine line there. That's what, yeah. and I know where Kevin's going with this, and he's right. And I've tried to manage it the best I can, yeah. but there is a difference. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if you do know where I'm going with it because that that is a good point. I know what you're talking about. So, um, but but I'm I'm going to use an example as as uh, Randy did. Um, let's say a city employee wants to poke fun at one of their leaders, mm -hmm. or one of the commissioners, one of the their supervisors. Is that going to be? I mean, is that going to be a, a no, no? I mean, do, how how is that punished? I mean, how well, am I that, punished if I go home and get on the Facebook tonight, which I never have, yeah. but and, and I get on? Uh, no, I get on Facebook. I'm not saying that, yeah. but I'm saying and 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 tear somebody down. That's something I don't do. I share pictures of my grandkids on equipment, all kinds of stuff. So I, I I do things of that nature, but I don't do the tear down thing. Yeah. I I do other you know things. So I just I just don't know if that's. Are you going to be able to punish somebody? No, except where you create liability for the employer. If if a supervisor and if a supervisor gets on, let's say, and and spends his time, his or her time, um, berating the uh, the terrible work habits of his specific, specific employees and calling them out by name, that would be something that could be he could face he or she could face consequences for. Um, 
because there's there it's hard for you not to believe that they're speaking for the city when they're in that decision making position. Sure. But it is also very clear in law that we cannot as much as you'd think that these social media policies and the, the big rub about them right now, this is not really a social media policy, but if you had one, you have to be real careful with those because the National Labor Relations Commission has uh, has decided that in places where you could have unions and stuff like that, you can't you can't keep people from talking bad about the boss. I mean, we all think that's a rule, but it, it's it's not. You can't say you can't talk about the terrible things that happen at work. Um, you know that that, that that's that that they term it chilling the the work environment, and so you have to be very careful about that. And you've got free speech issues too. You have a right to say things, but you also have the responsibility to to, to live with the consequences. Sure. This this does not create any. Um, uh, as far as set of repercussions or no, it provides, it says, it basically says in the beginning why we do this and you know, whether we need to have, make sure excellence in performance, we want you to put your best efforts forward. Um, if you do something, let's say an employee was to go home and and rip on, um, one of you guys or something, city staff member conduct with the commission, it says, uh, principles, cooperation, respect, demonstrate professionalism and nonpartisanship in all interactions with the community and in public meetings. Well, that would that contemplates somebody who stands up here and says, I don't like you SOBs and you not doing this. And that just and goes off on you in a public meeting and drops the mic and heads out. Okay. Now are they fired because they broke this ethics code? No, there's an entirely different way to handle that. Right. But the ethics code tells them that you're supposed to demonstrate professionalism and respect, whether you respect the person or not, you have to respect the fact they are a commissioner. Um, so this, this provides the guidelines, puts everybody on notice of it. Um, you know, we can, you as a commission, as you know, you the commission places its own, and the only thing you can do is the censure. That's to get that out of the way. That's all you can do. There's nothing else you can do under Kansas law. That's the, the really the only tool you have. So if we adopted this portion of it, like you're saying, and then we witnessed something of this nature, like someone on the internet was making fun of my disability or someone else's, that would then we would contact the city manager, make him aware of it, and then then you guys would meet and handle this situation. I mean, is that how it works? Well, it, when you police your, police yourselves, it would be, if it was another commissioner, it's a little bit different. If it was an employee, what you would do, just like you would now, if you saw, if you drove by a truck out there over Andrew Street, you drove by and all, all of Chad's guys were laid out in the, in the thing asleep. And the, it happens. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think it happens. But I, <laughs> but if that was to happen, you don't need this code of ethics to, to come in and face hell with Dave and, and get somebody to talk to. I mean, but Dave's still responsible for through Chad for the, the So if we witness people right now that are employees of the city doing this nature, we should contact Dave and let him know that. Your job as a commissioner is to bring your concerns about the city operations um, to Dave in that manner. That yeah. I, I kinda mean, like these rules already. Well and that, that and that's not these rules. That's just generally if you if, if your 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 job is the board of directors, you set the priorities, you, you you set that sort of stuff up for us and tell us what to do. So if you've got okay. knowledge of you know, and especially if it's something like a crime or something, you got wrongdoing, knowledge of wrongdoing, you got to bring it forward. Don't wait on it. I want That's make, not because of this. Yeah, I want to make sure that. Are you talking both their personal and professional page, or no? And you, you can raise the issue, but we cannot control what somebody does on their personal page. Yeah, what we can say is, I want to make sure we can, that that is. Cool. If somebody comes out, and especially gets into it in elections, and I, I hate. Those, uh, those things but if somebody it's okay for somebody at the on that works here at the city to to i suppose to uh be for or against any one of you in the election sure okay um my advice to them was i just would be real careful because you got to work here and not because somebody's going to fire you but because you got to be able to look these people in the eye every day and you got to make sure that you're able to do your job and so but that's different from can I tell somebody not to post something on their Facebook page? No, we don't. We probably can't. Um, you know, as long as they follow the rules and make sure that it, in their personal opinion, they're entitled to that. So, so, so to make sure on a personal page, they can say whatever they want about any one of us or anybody out there. I, you know, again, generally, I mean, okay. there, there are things, there are things someone could say whether they're an employee or not. I can address it. But yeah. I so I mean, if, if that be yeah. true, though, I, and I'm just trying to figure this all out. So if I, if 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 said if person A gets on his personal page and says, you know, I'm going to poke some fun at this guy because he's crippled, mm -hmm. then I can get right back on there. Or am I different because I'm a commissioner? 
Now I can't get back on there. Do I have a personal page or do I have a personal opinion or do I have personal beliefs or am I just now Commissioner Skitch and I can't do it or Commissioner Allen and can't do anything of that well, nature? Out, outside of the, the matters of this code of ethics, I think what I told you in February still holds true, which is if you're going to have, if you were, and it's for really for uh, open records issues, if you're going to have a, a page where you are transacting the business of your commissionership, then that becomes a city, and in sure. some ways a city asset. We have to produce those records. So my recommendation, my personal page, my recommendation to all of you is to is to separate those pages. If you're going to have one page, make it purely personal or purely that, or have two pages and clearly, and never the two shall meet. Yeah. Because as soon as you start mixing one or the other, what do we do? And that's off of this topic. What do we do when somebody makes a, a core request for all the posts that Commissioner Allen has made about this subject? Well, I can legitimately say if it's clear that you have a personal page and a professional page or a professional page, I can clearly say, well, we don't have any access to your personal page. How would he even get that? Because he clearly has a personal page. But if you've only got one page and it's all muddled in there, then I'm in that, uh, and actually Diane and I are in that, un, that bad position. I'm going to go to you and say, I need you to download your entire Facebook page so I can read through it and figure out what we have to produce. Right. And nobody wants to do that. And so, so I'm just trying to get it clear because I don't have a professional page. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just have my name on my yeah. You know the you know Kevin Allen from my Facebook or whatever. So yeah. so if I want to say anything, I can. I can put it on there. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, okay. The problem is you you say that though you can say it, but if you are if somebody takes you as giving the position of the city, or if if you say things that otherwise would be taken as a uh, you know speaking for the commission or you know that talking about what happens in a closed session that you're not supposed to that sort of thing. That is that is an issue. Um, and this is, I got to tell you also, this is an, this is an evolving area of law, kind of off the topic of this code of ethics, but it's an evolving area of law where what you say and where you say it has repercussions. And, you know, I, I can't tell you that I am personally satisfied with the way the law currently stands, but nobody asked me. I just have to tell you what it, what it says on a particular issue. Um, it's a difficult question, especially when Facebook pages are so muddled between personal and, and professional. So, but but back on the code of ethics, this provides you a way when you go to Dave or to Chad or something, you can say not just, hey, I got a problem with what this guy said. You can say, hey, he said these things, and I am relatively certain that calling me that name and using those four letters associated with me is not respectful. And then then you have a you got a a, a better definition of the complaint that you've made to Dave, so that he can go to the guy and say, look, here's the deal. Um, you're this is what was said to me and we can figure out, is it something that we have to ask them to do something with, or is it something we have to, to just put them on notice of, tell them we've gotten the complaint um, and you know, there's nothing the city can do about it. Because sometimes that's the answer. Sometimes the only remedy is, is a personal issue between you and somebody else. And that's well, the unfortunate level of it. I think that, you know, I think this is all good stuff because, you know, I think the awareness that, that uh, courtesy goes uh, amongst a lot of people a lot of different ways. So I, I, I hope that we all, you know, are able to, as far as employees and leaders or whatever we are, commissioners, um, can all extend that same type of courtesy to each other. I think it, and I think it also helps us if we all understand that and we all then – it is. It's going to get hot from time to time. There's just no way around it. We're going to be passionate about things, for and against them, and we're going to be, you know. That's great. That's what America was built exactly. on. Exactly. I mean, that's why sure. we left England. But it, it, it also allows us to be able to say, look, yeah, the person was being passionate, impassioned about the issue, but they weren't being disrespectful. That the fact that they disagree with you was not disrespectful. It's right. the way in which you just dis disagree, and you can get hot and you can get agitated, but we there's a line somewhere between. I'm being passionate doing my job and advocating a position and I'm being offensive and over the line. And it's hard to know that line unless we got something written down. But I would ask all of you to take a look at these, at these and get the input. I want to get input from as many folks as I can and having the discussions we had tonight, I'm going to go back through them again tomorrow and take a look and see what, how that looks. And Jeff, you know. could I suggest that as commissioners go through it, if they have things that they see between now and then to go ahead and get them to you or I so that we can be prepared yeah. to, rather than just bring up something next meeting that yeah. we, we can kind of let us know what you are questioning or something so we can get prepared for next yeah, meeting. Yeah, as much notice as you can give us that, that's great, but under, we also understand you're going to think of things on the fly. I do have to remind you for 
for coracoma issues. It is, we can discuss, you and I can discuss your individual concerns and I can reflect that in uh, drafts. What I would ask you not to do is to three of you to get together and send me a single email because that becomes a meeting and then we've got a problem. Um, and send it just to me and, and Dave or, you know, but don't, don't include more commissioners on it. Um, I will report an open meeting next time. The, the, the things that I've gotten, unless you tell me you don't want me to tell people, um, but I'll, I'll tell you what changes were made and why and what input I got. Um, but we need to make sure that we are, we're able to talk and get these things out. We don't want to run afoul of, of a meeting issue. Yeah, that's got me um, scared to even open emails sometimes because people will tag several commissioners on things. And, and I don't even know there's other people on there because I'm not real tech savvy. And I may respond to the person and then find out that there was five of us on this thing. And, and I've already said my opinion. And so I just pretty much give up responding to anybody at this point. So I would appreciate if you guys don't even tag me and that kind of stuff. That way I don't. Well, and I'll tell you, I, I did an email tonight uh, passing along some information, but well, the way I did that to avoid, to avoid the errant reply. Do each one single. I, well, I did, I did one, I did it to Dave and a blind carbon copy to each of you. That way it went to Dave and each of you got a copy. And if you hit reply all, that's only going to go to Dave and I and you, it's not going to, not going to inadvertently create that, can't you just send it to us singly? I yeah, you know, I can, but my, my, my only worry about that is if, if later, you know, I, I want to make sure everybody gets it. And if, and if I if I do it singly, because what what you'll see when you get it, you won't see everybody else that got the BCC on there. And I, and we can do it singly, you know, however it gets to you that way. I just want to make sure that we don't end up where inadvertently everybody's getting except for Commissioner Watts. And I sent something out that's important. I intended to put her on there. And I just, I got a phone call in the middle and I missed hers or I mistyped her name or something. And I, I, th that's just a way of, of, of checking it to make sure that everybody gets it. But we need to be cognizant of that. And you got the right idea. Be very careful when you hit the reply button. Just be very careful. Well, I'm not hitting it. Yeah, well, that's you just said good, good reply. I, I have a problem with that. I've gotten better at just hitting reply instead of reply all. Well, that's just society now is is um, is that you know, and I don't, I'm not tech savvy. That's the problem. I haul dirt, so you know when somebody says something to me and I respond to them, I feel like it's just me and them. I don't know. There's 15 other people on there looking at it, so stop tricking me. I worked somewhere where they took the reply all button out of Microsoft. Just at the, it was a multinational corporation. They just paid somebody to go in and remove that because somebody high up had hit the reply all button and embarrassed himself. Yeah, that was on the office. That was Michael and Jan. Well, this was this was before my this was even before Michael and Jan, and it was a huge international issue. No, I now. seen it. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> What's this office you speak of? Um, does anybody have any other questions on these for tonight? I'm I'm happy to take input on them, and it's it's they're working documents. Like I said, we need to make sure we have this. The code probably should be the code of ethics should be should replace our current ethics code. So once we got that set, we'll, we'll format that to fit in the code. The I'm still up in the air as to whether the code of procedure is just something you pass that's like a uh, that needs to be in the code or whether it just needs to be the the code of procedure that we all agree to. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still thinking on that. Um, I don't know. If we need to put that in the city code as a, uh, separately. So. Because you had said, too, if we adopted that, then it would be a blueprint for other boards to be able to, just to understand, well, why, for one example, we just created the newly, uh, the street advisory board, and, I mean, unless somebody sits down and explains it to each individual and how, I mean, some they probably have an idea, um, these individuals wanted to step up and be on a board, but walking in blindly on how to set up. It gives a person yeah. and how to address and things like that. It would and you're able to, if you want to have a different procedure, we just say that, look, and the way I've written the code of procedures just said this should be, is intended to be used by all subservient or, or created boards and commissions under you unless you provide otherwise. And so where it says commissioner, it can mean board member and that sort of thing. And it gives them something to look at so that they, they're not, I mean, you know how hard it was for each of you your first time on this and trying to, if you had come in as the mayor in charge of running the meeting, I mean, you know, deer in headlights. Some of these people are very good at their at their jobs and they're, they're, they bring experience to a board or commission, but they aren't professional board and commission members. So this gives them a way to, to work on it. And they watch you do it on online so they'll be able to, to follow suit. Any other questions? No. Thank you. I need to officially Thank you for your work. I have to apologize to Diane for creating so many things for her to do in this, but I did talk to her a little bit about it. I sprung a few things on her, but I talked to her a little bit about it. So. Hopefully uh, I'm still Mayor, um, Chad's here, and he went, uh, 
Pete, Commissioner Allen wanted an update from Andrick, so I think if Chad can get that over with him, we can go into the commission. And I'll try not to make take up too much time. Pete, can you hear me okay? I hear you. Okay. Um, you want me to wait for Kevin, or you want me to keep going? Go ahead. Okay. I think he's pretty yeah. surprised at the yeah. situation yeah. over there. Um, just to give you a quick little update on it, this project, uh, you guys asked us to have the water line completed by June 1st. I'm, I'm happy to admit that we made that happen. Uh, it took us till June 1st to get it done, but it, that water line is in service and active now. Uh, we actually begin over there on May 11th, um, and that was excavation to install conduit to house the temporary water line running underneath Andrick Street um, and allow those customers over there to have that service uh, while we did this work. Coupled with all the rain um, in there too, on the 19th, the water distribution crew began digging at the 6th Street intersection to make the tie-in at the 8-inch reducer. Um, the street department began stabilizing the remainder of the roadway using 4-inch ditch liner and clean rock to give residents and ourselves access to the property and road um, during this process. On the 20th, the water distribution crew finished the tie-in at that 6th Street intersection, uh, completing concrete th thrust box on the valves and fire hydrant. The street crew finished stabilizing the rest of the roadway going to the north to 5th Street um, because that's the direction that we took traffic out while we were working at the, at the southern end. Um, at this time, the, I brought the two crews together, so the street department and the water department were working together. Uh, the water department was, they were laying the pipe, making the taps, and doing the majority of the backfill while the three street department employees were uh, digging the trench and removing the spoils. The 21st, we continued with the street department doing the excavation uh, and removal and the water distribution, installing the pipe, making those service taps, and following the proper backfill procedures. Uh, we had another day of rain in there, coupled with Memorial Day. Uh, the 26th, the water distribution crew had to spend um, that day working a main break at another location, and my street department crew spent the day uh, making some brick repairs on some, some holes at different locations as well. Uh, the 27th, we got back over there. We excavated the remaining 160 feet of trench to the 5th Street tie-in location. We installed the remaining pipe and made those service connections and backfilled the trench as much as we could. At that time, we secured the pipe with the excavator and flushed the cleaning pig through the entire main. On the 28th, we spent the morning securing and capping off that new 6-inch water main and installed chemical to disinfect the new main segment, and it rained all afternoon, so that was pretty good timing to uh, allow the disinfectant to work. The 29th, I brought in the crew to work again. Uh, we spent the day flushing that disinfectant chemical out of the new main segments, making the final tie-in at the 5th Street intersection and connecting all existing meter sets and putting new main into service. On June 1st, that was, uh, the first was Monday, I think, this week, we came in. Uh, we completed a pressure test on that new main segment. We did have a few repairs to make to two individual meter sets and KV valves, as well as a fire hydrant. Um, once we got that taken care of, I'm happy to announce that we we uh, we did help we did hold the pressure test um, on that new main segment at 50 psi for the entire time. Um, with that, thank you, Pete. I'm pretty proud of the guys. They worked pretty hard with all the rain and stuff in there to get it in the time. Unfortunately, it took so many people to get it done. I I, I agree, Chad, and I, I appreciate the efforts and uh, I observed a lot of what you talked about and I and I concur with what you did. Good, thank and, you. And. Uh, uh, one thing that I did kind of want to do at the same time as the water line was prepare the road base and stuff, um, making that removal and compaction at the same time. But with all the rain that we've had in the last two or three weeks, um, you know, I really felt strongly that we needed to get the water line in there first and get those customers taken care of um, and then move forward from there. With you guys approving, you know, the bid for the concrete work uh, this evening, as well as the interlocal agreement with the county. Uh, you know, I feel confident as long as the weather holds out and right now it's looking good minus a chance of rain, you know, I think uh, Thursday and Thursday night. Um, I'm hoping by, by mid next week that we'll have that road ready for that contractor to come in, do the remainder of the curb and gutter, and then so shortly after that, allow the county to come in and lay that uh, asphalt on that roadbed. So you think, you think we're in good shape for finishing by July 1? 
Um, what are we just? What is today's date, Pete? I don't even. Know. Just, <laughs> I don't even just, know. Just, just June the second. Um, yes, I I hope so. Uh, I know I am just as ready to be done and out of that project as you guys are uh, talking about it. And the residents are uh, dealing with the mess over there. So as long as the weather holds out and everything goes smoothly, like I like I plan it doing. Uh, you know, I've asked, I've met you over there a couple times with some suggestions. I've also talked to Kevin, um, as well as some engineers and stuff, and I think we're we're good moving forward. We actually, uh, Kevin, I told you I would touch base on on this a little bit earlier. We uh, we are working well with the uh, county right now. The Jim Harris and the county commission obviously have agreed to do that asphalt over there, as well as offer up some some equipment they're not that they're not being used right now. Uh, the three pieces of equipment that we're talking about, two we've already got on the job, is uh, a, a big road reclaimer that we're going to use to to basically pulverize that base and stuff over there and grind it all in. Uh, the second is their big pad foot compacting machine, um, obviously to to achieve the compaction that we that we need to have over there, not only for the curb and gutter but the road surface itself. And then as we come in with the with the AB3 base on top, we'll also have a rubber tire roller board from them to help achieve that compaction. Um, I do have some numbers uh, right here real quick. The total amount of rock that we use to kind of stabilize that road and allow us to get in there and work, uh, coupled with the clean rock that we use for the bedding and some of the backfill of the pipe and the AB3 base to bring all that up, uh, you know, to grade right now, uh, $3,673.46. By entering into this agreement, the interlocal agreement with Bourbon County, we can basically cut that number in half. Love it. Uh, oh. I do too. So I look forward to working with uh, Jim and everybody else, and and, and moving forward. Chad, I'll, I'll say this. I mean, if you don't mind, I just I really am excited about the interlocal agreement because it, if you if you look at it as half the money, that means we're getting twice as much bang for a buck. I mean, it's amazing, and and this is a great great opportunity for us to seize this um you know and and again we didn't talk about this but it's going to go the same with asphalt you know asphalt a lot of uh, maybe some people out there don't know that's a very hard product to come up with you know uh, chad and we helped haul some asphalt last year we had to go clear to i believe it was mound city to that, haul was, that was a couple of years ago but yeah we went all the way to mound city to get it I, yeah i don't know it seemed like last year but um so yeah, I mean, that is a crazy cool deal because now they've got their own batch plan out there. They're making asphalt. So that means that we're going to be able to cut and patch streets and things of that nature. Um, so that's another great part about the interlocal agreement. Um, and I think that's – I was over there with Pete as well and saw you guys work on the street, and, and it it appeared the guys were excited, and they were they were, they were were hammering. And everybody was on a, a team effort, so it was really – it was pretty cool to see. Um, one thing I would suggest – for people that aren't able to see that, is maybe with your phone or whatever as prevalent as they are nowadays, you take a few pictures of it as the process is going along, and that way Susan can teach you how to put pictures up on this big screen like we do, and or like I do. Well, I'm glad you said that because I was listening to the previous conversation about the Facebook posts and everything like that. Uh, you know, as much as I like getting on there and reading everything, I really try to stay out of it. I don't know how to operate Facebook, so I do stay out of it. Uh, most of the time when I'm on there, I'm looking at stuff that I can't afford to buy off a of marketplace <laughs> or, uh, or something like that. But I, you have the, I thought you had a credit card for the city though. Is <laughs> that not, uh, I, I, I don't have as much of a limit as a city manager. So oh, okay. I'm, 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 uh, I'm limited on that, but uh, well, that was, I'm sorry, Dave, that was just a bad joke. Yeah. See now we're, that whole thing Jeff's been talking about is going to come into play right here. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, we'll see you. Yeah. <laughs> So you made you made me lose my train of thought. You got me in trouble here. Uh, well, Chad, I have a, I have a question. Uh, what what do you think your time frame is as as far as getting the uh, uh, the uh, trench drain in the French drain that we're putting in there? The uh, the, uh, the six inch pipe that I, I had to order it. I got it local here in town. It won't be here till Thursday. Uh, they do have enough with a four inch drain, so we're going to go ahead and start. Actually, the guy has spent uh, a lot of today. Over there, working on getting that dug out and cleaned up, and getting some of the the excess water. Uh, luckily, we haven't had any rain for several days, so it's kind of drying up on its own right now, which is you know is is good for us. Um, but we will continue to move forward on that. Are you still uh, still with uh, use, utilizing the clean rock you've got there? Yes, sir. Uh, for that. Drain? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, we we might have some utility adjustments on that that we need to make. 
Um, but we we uh, we re-upped our low our utility locates, you know, with the rain and us working over there and stuff. Some of the marks were were obviously destroyed. Um, so we got to get some some fresh marks over there on the ground to see where everything's at. Uh, I do know that we spent some time today uh, looking for a phone line. We're not sure where it's at. Uh, so once we get those marked and stuff, we'll be able to move forward, you know, even further with that. On, two questions on that. Why why would we go six inch on the on the drain, on the backside of the curb. Is that what you're talking about the backside of the curb? Actually, Pete and I discussed uh, two drains. Uh, there, There's two pipes coming out of two different properties over there that are four inch that run pretty full. Um, and, and, and we feel that it would benefit us if we tied those in to a four inch. Um, and then also had a six inch in the back of there as well to catch whatever surface water is running off the hill. Okay. Uh, the adjustments are going to be more along the lines now at the Fifth Street end. Uh, we also talked about burying a bigger drain pipe um, on further west down towards Broadway for maybe some possible future expansion um, of a storm drain system, curbing gutter of, of some sort, maybe one of these days. Uh, but that's where the phone line in question is at, is down there at that end. Um, and obviously, I don't think anybody wants to go through the time of extend, extending this project out any further to possibly relocate that phone line. If we can't get around it, so here in the you know the next day or so, I'll spend a lot of time. Last question: to Figure that out. Is it, are we hauling the asphalt and backing up to their laid out machine, or are they doing the whole process? And what's the square footage? From my on? understanding, the county is gonna they're gonna make and haul and lay that asphalt over there. With the interlocal agreement, we've also got prices for them to make it and haul it to our machine, as well as the rock. We've got a price for them. Correct me if I'm wrong, Susan. We've got a price for them to haul rock to us if we, we don't have trucks or people available. And we've also got a price for us to go get rock from their quarry. Well, that, yeah. was, that was a question I had in the interlocal agreement. The county uh, will install asphalt mm -hmm. in the city at $80 a ton. That includes hauling it? Yes, sir. And laying all it. In. That's making it, hauling it, laying it, okay. rolling it. Everything. Okay. Yes, sir. Start to finish. Okay. So that that include that that's not defined here. It just you know those you know that that is a question. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Is that normal? I mean, because everything I've ever bid in asphalt has been square foot. Not necessarily. In yeah. my experience, it's yeah. just the project. That's certain right. projects and engineers will will bid it different way, whether it's square foot. Uh, yards, tons. Yeah. I think it'd be interesting, too, as we move on in the future, and I don't want to keep hammering on it tonight, but as we went on the future, if we can get a, a square footage price from the county also, it would be easier for us to calculate because we it's pretty easy to measure square footage. Well, it's easy to measure tonnage, too, yeah. off the square footage. <laughs> like I said, moving on. <laughs> Talk, talking about one of those apps on your phone, there's a, there's an app to figure the tonnage and stuff. I and know. They're, yeah. they're all pretty close. Come plus, on, plus, we also use a, uh, uh, an asphalt resource calculator as well to figure those tonnages, too. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah. So right, before, we, before we get off, Andrew, let's just go ahead and take care. You asked me to talk to commission or to the staff about uh, what to do for those people and uh, really, we the only thing we could really come up with, and it's been approved that we. Can I, do. I can't hear you, Dave. Uh, you asked for the staff to come up with a way to uh, recognize those families that have been through this process uh, since we couldn't give them a break on um, their bills, and we would suggest that you give a buck run, uh, offer a buck run family membership or a golf family membership. We won't have family memberships for the pool this year. I guess you could offer a family membership for the pool next year if they wanted to do that. Um, but that's what we came up with and is legal for us to do. Let, let me clarify what you just said. You're recommending we do that, or those are the things that we could legally do if, are, we, if we chose to? So we're both. We're recommending that you, that's what you do, and they are, well, you asked for us to come up what would be um, legal. legal, and that's what, so really that's legal. Those are two different things you just told me. One is that they're legal. One is that you, as the administrative staff, are telling us or are recommending. And I just want to be clear because I have a, I have an opinion about this. My opinion is that we've got, and I'll just throw it out, and so everybody else is, is that we've already gotten ourselves in a rabbit hole trying to do it the other way. And so I'm not sure that this doesn't. It sets a less of precedent, but precedent, but it still sets a precedent for when we have complications and people. 
I, I understand they were put in a bad position, but I, I guess I challenge the commission, do we really want to set any kind of precedent for giving awards or rewards or whatever for uh, I, unfortunate, unfortunate circumstances? I'm just, it's... I think we already do this. I think we've already set precedent um, in um, chamber, co chamber coffees. We give out free passes to the pool. We give out free memberships to Buck Run. We give out all kinds of things in chamber coffee. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the fact is we do give these out. We're talking about five houses, am I right, um, over there? Sure how many are. Oh, I, I believe it's five. Uh, I mean, these people have been sure through these people have been through a lot in the last year, and you know, it's it, in my opinion, it's kind of a you know, it's kind of a slap just giving them a free pool pass or whatever it is. But it's something, and if that's what we can do legally, now I'd say give them one of all three: membership to the golf club, whatever. Well, uh, I I uh, I don't know how many of those people would uh, would utilize a membership to the golf club uh, I I think that it would be legal and we we've, we've set a a uh, an dollar amount of about what thirty eight hundred dollars or something of that uh, with a uh, a per household uh, number uh, what would be wrong with us giving a voucher uh, to those people for that X amount of dollars that they could use for whatever payments they want to make or for whatever they utilize for the coming year to, to, to use when they pay their bill. A simple voucher. Uh, that wouldn't be giving them free water. And that's the, that's the objection of, the, uh, of giving them free water. Statute says you can't. But there's nothing that says we can't give them a voucher for that same amount of, of dollars that they can use each month to pay that bill or to help pay that bill. That's what I would recommend. What I can tell you from the uh, city attorney's side of things is that the uh, we looked at the issue and the scope of things that the city manager talked about, and I would even include some way to let them into the pool since we're doing, I guess, day passes. I, I don't see a problem with providing vouchers if it's not paying for water bills because I think we're the way that statute is written for water bills I am very I'm recommending against any um, there's no leeway payment that allows them to pay a water bill with that but if they decide to buy their way into the um, the golf course or the swimming pool or whatever and then that means they don't have to use that money that they would have used it there to pay their water bill um, money is fungible money's money um, we can't hand them cash, but if they want to use it uh, to go to the the pool or buck run or you know pay their their fees to go play basketball or football or baseball or something, if we sponsor those things, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Water rates, however, it caused me heartache. Well, what about uh, sewer rates? I did. We did not find a provision of law that said anything specifically about sewer rates, but we we did find them specifically about water rates. Yeah. Um, so they could use it to pay their sewer portion of the of the bill. I didn't find any legal objection to that. Well, I would make a recommendation. Or, Go ahead. Is it my turn? I I would recommend that we. That we issue those vouchers to that to each one of those uh, citizens to the amount that we agreed upon in previous meetings. I think that's a motion. How does that work? That's a motion. I mean, you know, what's the difference between cash and a voucher? I'm just, you know, we're well as long as they don't use it to pay for the for the water rates. I mean, but it, it would, if it's a voucher, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but like, if it's a voucher, they have to, they can only use it at the. Is that is that what we're saying? They can I, only use it for a city entity. As I understand it, it would it, the voucher idea, which is a new one to me uh, on this tonight, but could be used, I guess, for any. City service that's not otherwise prohibited by law, water rates would be prohibited by, or water, water fees are prohibited by law. Um, I'm much, I'm very confident in the types of city services that the staff recommended in terms of the uh, recreational activities and things. The reason why they picked those was because there are a number of other Kansas cities that do uh, 
similar things. They provide free passes to you know community centers, walking trails, up at Overland Park, things like Deanna Rose, stuff like that. I mean, those types of services where there's no legal objection, uh, you can do that uh, without a problem. So. So what's the amount on the motion you made, Pete? What's the amount? I, I think we had a $3,800 total uh, figure yeah, between we, five. We didn't bring it, but he, she had each household. Yeah, I yeah. I think the largest one was like $500. The only thing I would say, Pete, is the one being a rental house on the corner. Um, how would that affect them being the previous yeah. Well, they, I think uh, the one you're talking about is there was nobody living there last year. So that wouldn't even be included that in the one. wouldn't be included. No. It, all we were, all we were. If, as long as that's legal, I'll second your motion. I'm, I'm going to offer an amendment to your motion that if it's approved, um, that it not be uh, instituted until we have absolute assurance from the attorney that that's legal. It sounded like some question. I hate to make the paper twice, four times for doing it, not doing it, and you well, know, plus we don't really have yet. vouchers, so we're going to have to come up with a way yeah. to voucher and then write it. Um, I mean, yeah. Really I think if you, I think if the if the motion is to direct the staff to bring the voucher issue forward, so we can make it legal and, and figure out a legal way to do it, that I have no no problem with that sort of a of a motion. Uh, passing from a legal standpoint, but I, I would I'm nervous about passing things pending whether right I we've already found ourselves in that position once legal. before. Pete, can you hear him? Okay. And it's not because I don't believe that that, that it may it may or may not be legal. I, I don't think that it isn't legal, but I also just heard about it five minutes ago, and it's difficult to to give a good con complete response on that without some time to look it up. Pete, would you be? Um would you agree to the amendment that we are to your motion that we give it to the the staff to look into the voucher? Yes. As opposed to just agreeing to give them a voucher, is that? Am I understanding that correctly? I said yes. Okay, I'm just trying to clarify. Yes, I will. Uh, before you vote, I just want to make sure I understand that. So we're going to come. We're going to come back next commission meeting, or Susan is, <laughs> with a voucher system that has a dollar amount and a way for us to track those amounts for those. Yeah, houses. kind of like chamber bucks. Yeah. And the legal reassurance. And the list of the yeah. list of things that's usable on. Yeah. Correct. The list that we've got. Perfect. Using yes, I'm guessing. That we have previously provided. Yes. Susan says using the amounts previously provided. Yes. Okay. What do you want? Yes. Kevin Allen? Yes. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Chad. Hey, uh, see you tomorrow. All right. Next, um, we have Kevin. Uh, vacancy in office of city commissioner. Yeah, Jeff, did you want to? Will you want to read that? And and uh, I'll make the motion that I mean I think we've cleaned it up a little bit and got exactly what we need to. And I want to I want to go ahead and make the motion that we pass that. This is not an agenda item. Uh, so I call for a point of order. Uh, first off, we talked about earlier in our discussions the uh, um, finality of decisions. This basically is substantially the same ordinance that's already been defeated three to two. So I, I, I heard what you said about somehow wanting to tell your people that you're still doing this. But it's, in point of fact, it's, the finality of the motion is that it it's not passed. And secondly, it's not on the agenda to vote for. So. Uh, I I don't know that we should address this at all. Why did you Why did you bring that up then, Joanne or Mayor yeah, yeah, Mitchell? It is on the agenda. It's in your commission comment time. So I guess it's on the agenda. Who talked to Kevin that said he wanted to talk about this meeting? I did. And I, I, uh, yeah, I spoke to Susan and I asked her to put it on the agenda. Yeah. Is What's that Is that agenda? legal to do, Jeff? <laughs> 
the point that Commissioner uh, Nichols brings up is a good one. You, but this it is not substantially changed, in my opinion, from the motion that was defeated. So what you're really asking again is for a motion to reconsider the previous vote, to go back and do that over again. Now, we don't currently have the rules of procedure in place. If we did, that, that sort of rule that covers it says basically once decisions are made, they should be final unless there's a substantial change, which in my opinion, there hasn't been a substantial change in the motion yet. We're still talking about doing pretty much the same thing, tweak the language a little bit. Um, and so it's it's not been changed, right? So, yeah, so it's not really been changed. I've made the motion. So it would be a, it would be a, it would basically be a motion to reconsider the previous vote, and the we if the rules that were in place, somebody who was on the winning side of that defeat would have to propose that it be reconsidered and it would have to be seconded by somebody on that side too and then we vote on it same way we did that before but again we don't another reason why we need these rules in place is that i don't have a rule that i can point to and say you absolutely can't do it this way because sure. this is the deal um hey, I, also here's the I also don't have a way to tell you ahead of time if you want to bring it up this is the way to do it or the way not to do it so it's going to be up to the five of you to determine whether this issue was final enough or if this has changed enough to be a new item or what you'd want to do with it I, as it, you've made clear i believe that you'd like to revisit the issue and we need to determine what the majority's will is on this of the five of you and how you want to do that yes ma'am um i have a question i'm it's just stating that it's an ordinance um and i you know just was able to read over it uh and i what is changing this verbiage from being a regular ordinance to being a charter ordinance? Because we've had discussions about this um, after the, the previous commission meeting and I think immediately following the commission meeting after the, before that as well. Um, and, and like I said earlier, I guess I would preface this. We had a conversation about it earlier too. I, I want to be sure that my understanding is correct because when we've talked about it before, um, changing the way that the state is um, the state statute currently reads that would take a charter ordinance and what you and I had talked about setting out more of an, uh, an ordinance um, that would clarify how to fill a vacancy as opposed to changing the way we fill a vacancy um, yeah. we just haven't been able to put that together in verbiage because there's been a lot of yeah the on your plate the background on that, and I'll try and put it as succinctly as I, as I can, two types of ordinances we have in play, a charter ordinance and a regular home rule ordinance. The, current, the state statute at 25-2117 provides for a fallback position. If we don't have any other law on the, on the books, then it, it, uh, uh, it, it goes to a vote of the five of you, the, or the four remaining if one person leaves, and doesn't provide for um, a tie break. Um, our... Ordinance 3290, I believe it was, it was passed some time ago. Um, you're allowed to, a charter ordinance would exempt you from um, an ordinance that doesn't apply to everybody universally. Um, a regular ordinance can augment state law on a subject. We currently have ordinance 3290 that augments the state law and says in the event of a tie, it goes to the city, man, uh, the city attorney, right. which we've all agreed is probably not the best way to do it. And at least we've talked about that. Oh, I, okay, I, I, miss, I misspoke there. I've said I'm uncomfortable with that potentially, and ha, ha, and I've told anybody who's asked me how I would how I would basically want to force you guys to make the decision anyway. <laughs> um, uh, and however, we can get that done. But we have a we have a law in the books that modifies state law. So if you a simple change to the to the details of that might be a, a regular ordinance might work. But when we were talking about going to the Bourbon County Commission and things like that, that sufficiently changes from the state model enough that I was concerned that that change would be susceptible to a claim that it should have been a charter ordinance. That's not on there now, though, right? It's not, it's not currently drafted as a charter ordinance. Right. I think we, we, and we got rid of that earlier when we talked the first time about whether we are going to keep that Bourbon County. So we've County changed it a couple times. Well, but the last one that was, was, was voted on was not the charter ordinance. Um, as I recall, but the last time we can, we talked about it, it was basically in the same format. Um, and it was voted down three to two. Um, well, it, it just, just to kind of end this whole thing, mm -hmm. this whole thing, I still believe in, in my heart of hearts that it's the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. 
and that's why I wanted it brought up again. And I thought the proper way to do it was to call and have it put on the agenda. And that way we could discuss it rather than to bring it up in the Commissioner Allen uh, section. So, I, you know, I think we've discussed it. And, and if everybody, you know, I've made a motion. And if there's no second, I guess it's going to die of lack of a second. Well, and I, I would I, I would agree with that. And I think that uh, I think that if at the end of the day the the question as it currently stands on this ordinance that we had before that's been resolved. If there was a sufficient change, uh, some new way to do it that was different enough from that last way, it's something that could come back up again as an ordinance change. It might. I think there's nothing there's nothing that prevents you commissioner allen or any other commissioner here from talking about whatever they want to talk about in commissioner minutes that's where you should that's where the theory is that's where things go that don't really have another place and and saying what you just said here which i believe is heartfelt that you wish that it had been different and you'd like to see it reconsidered perfectly perfectly acceptable and it, it needs to be said if that's the way you feel absolutely uh, i just feel like taking applications for a position that we have when people ran for it is not a is not a fair way. I don't think we should be choosing the success for somebody successor for someone that is either passed on or stepped down for other reasons. I believe it should go back to the election, and, and I'll go to my grave saying that. So, yeah. Okay. No second. So, all right. So, I, with no second, do you still take roll? No. No. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right, um, Kevin. Is that all you have? No, ma'am. Is it Commissioner Allen's time now? Yeah. That that's why I was saying that. Your vacancy thing was under your commission minutes, so that's why I did, we didn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Okay, yeah. I see where that is. Oh, that's why it's on the agenda. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Um, Susan, can I ask you again how to put that thing up on the um, thing? <clears throat> While she's doing that, um, I guess um, <laughs> one question I have is: Did they did they get that new truck in for the water? I do not know plant yet. Yeah. Uh, no. We, we were waiting to call Purple Way to make sure that they received the check. So we're waiting on, make sure the right. check's been there, and then we'll go get it. Okay. You're up. Okay. Well, that's weird. <laughs> you got my best side. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I don't understand how these things work sometimes. Okay, first of all, I guess uh, I've got some... Speak into your microphone, please. Don't tell me what to do. Get it closer. Huh? <laughs> okay. Okay. First of all, this is what I was going to talk about. This here, this truck, um, I'm pretty um, pretty excited about because we um, uh, about what two or three months ago, somewhere in that nature, um, you know, Michael and, and them had some extra money that came from an insurance claim of twenty four thousand dollars that we was going to be able to purchase a a vehicle with, and they needed a truck, and they told me kind of their you know, their specifications for what they wanted. They not really necessarily pulling a trailer or anything of that nature. And, but when I asked them, I said, how many people are going to be riding in a truck? They said two, usually one, two, possibly three at the most, but they really want a four wheel drive truck. And I considered them to be kind of a, uh, uh, what's that word that we're hearing a lot now, a, a service that's really needed um, because they are in charge of wastewater. And essential. Essential. I knew it was something fancy like that. But there's this essential business, and there are some muddy times and things down there at the sewer treatment plant. So we started looking for bargains on vehicles and things of that nature, I'm hoping. Um, but anyway, we got up there. I went to the water treatment plant and spent a couple hours with Scott and the other guys up there. And we found this little truck that they really, really liked and thought would work for them. And um, it's, a, it's a 2013 Chevrolet, and it's only got about 136,000 miles on it, I believe, and it comes with a 6.0 motor, which is a real dependable motor. And we was able to get in on it for, I think, what, Susan, is it 7,200, 7,250, somewhere in that neighborhood, tax all in, 10%, buyer's fee, everything else. It comes out of Moscow Mills, Missouri. So the guys are going to, I believe what they're going to do is they're going to take a part-time guy and a regular guy up, and they're going to bring it back. 
Um, you know, I mean, I guess the reason I show you that is because, you know, I'm I'm was secure in the fact that I could find him a cheaper vehicle, and I feel like we saved about twenty thousand eight hundred dollars by buying this vehicle. Uh, one of the questions that I asked was in the meeting was, what happens to that money? If we don't get to spend it on a vehicle, are you going to take that money from us? But I think what that money does, if I'm correct, Susan, it stays with the sewer or the water treatment plant or what have, have you, and it goes in their fund to purchase things that we need. Um, I guess the point in saying that is that I, I really hope and feel like, you know, you know, and uh, Travis, I'm not trying to cut on your vehicle, but I remember a, a, a meeting before when we spent $25,000 a piece on two vehicles. Um, and one of them was a Lake Patrol truck. Lake Patrol, we need a truck. The other truck he had was an old rust bucket, but it still got around just fine. Um, I wish that I would have been able to help at that point in time because I think we could have probably thrown another, you know, um, close to $30,000 in our pocket real fast. Um, this is going to be an avenue that I'm going to pursue on several items. And I'm just, uh, I guess the reason I brought that up is just, um, pretty excited that we was able to save that kind of money and yet get the guys the truck that they wanted so yeah, well, well i well i congratulate done. i congratulate you on on the saving of the money but we could also push this forward and like let's say we need a new excavator we could do the same thing absolutely we need a dozer uh we need a roller we need a rubber tired roller we need we can we can use this same avenue chad yeah obviously chad and i is chad still here no, I think he lived. Yeah. Um, okay, so Chad and I have discussed that on several items. And he and, and we bought this on Chad's – well, not Chad's, but the city's bidder number. It was really cool because the city helped set up a bidder number for this particular website. You know, I buy off of Purple Wave, Big Iron, Auction Time, uh, things of that nature. And we have local representatives that work for Auction Time too. And that's going to be another thing that this local rep is actually the auctioneer that works here is Lance – Anderson, and he is a rep for auction time and can help Chad look for equipment. Michael and I have also spoke about this, and right. you know, it, it's it's just a great avenue. I, I've bought a, a a lot of things off these, and it is kind of a, it's kind of a gamble. You know, if this thing blows up on the way home, I may be at the next meeting talking about well, new new motor. That's right, but the new motor is already you can buy a brand new motor setting at uh, local parts stores for less than two thousand dollars. So still way in the money if that was to happen. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. So I wanted to show that to you. This is another one. This is, this is the not exciting part. Um, and I was hoping Chad was here cause this is going to be at third and Judson. If you just go out here and go right over third and Judson, right by the courthouse, this is something that's frequently traveled, uh, by a lot of people that go to the courthouse ourselves. That's right there on the curve. This, this street is so bad, um, that there's bricks laying in the street. I mean, people are picking up chunks of asphalt and bricks and throwing them on the, um, on the side of the road to make sure that they don't, um, I mean, look at that. That is, that's not, not a good thing. The washout down through there, that's where the curb and gutter and everything has failed. And I mean, there is a big hole there that is not a, uh, not a great thing. And, so that, that, that's that right there. There's the bricks I was talking about where people, I don't know whether people or the, the guy at the courthouse or whoever's picking up the bricks that are flailing out of the street and stacking them in the yard. Um, that is, we need, to, we need to address that pretty quick. This is another one that is getting ready to be patched. I was pretty excited as I traveled down. I think it's Crawford. This is going to be somewhere around the fur, second. First, it's first in Crawford. Yeah, Somewhere I brought that, that to his attention at the last meeting, actually. Yep, and the reason I brought that, I, I took a picture of it, is because although I am excited there's concrete in the hole and it's getting ready to be patched, rather than concrete, is a couple reasons. One, it shows right there in the concrete area, that's how we've been doing it in the past, is when we don't want to replace the bricks, we just put it back in concrete, and that is not a, an attractive-looking thing as we move on. The second thing is that form board up there is a great thing. I like that. But the way that concrete was patched in, if you look right on the outside edges of it, it should have been square cut. You know, if you look right in this area here, what I would like to have seen is a, is a concrete saw come in here and cut this across square to, to where it would hold. It's not going to adhere like this. What's going to happen is this is all, every bit of this is going to break and flail out. If the first thaw and crack, this water is going to get down in these crevices right here, and it's going to expand and contract, and it's going to blow it out. We're going to be right back here the same point 
we're going to have to take bricks out of this section and put another foreign board here and pour it and then bring the bricks back to it. So before we do that, we probably need to go in there and fix that properly. So, well, the uh, the patch itself is a violation of city ordinance. Well, it, you don't you don't do that anymore. Right, right. The, the whole thing is a violation of city ordinance. So uh, you're you're talking multiple problems there. Right, right. And that's what you know. That's some of the things we want to get away from when we when we move on. And I think that you know, like I said, um, um, Chad and Pete have seemed to have been working. Can I turn this off somehow now, Susan? I'm done with picture, picture time. Picture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I suppose <clears throat> what I'm getting at there is that, you know, these these streets, as we showed last time, or as I showed last time on pictures, um, I really want to make sure we're addressing the issues on Wall Street. It's been two weeks, and I know the guys have been working on Andrew, but That's we need to get... They're planning on and they're getting the deal with the county will allow us to fix numerous ones. I know Wall Street is high priority. Right, right. And and Wall Street, if nothing else, although I am not in love with the pothole patcher, yeah. that thing needs to go over there and fit, fix that one that, uh, you know, Dave and I were able to ride around and look at a few holes. And that one, I can you can lose a, a, a motorcycle in. So we need to have something in that thing. And um, as well as over here by City Hall, have we... Have we talked about a way to address this issue over here to fix this big crevice where you fall off in the whistle? No. I can tell you how to fix that, and it's really simple. T tell it's, Chad and I. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's simple. Yeah. It's with a piece of angle iron, some concrete bolts, and a steel plate, yeah. and you will take a lot of liability off the city of Fort Scott. And if somebody else has a better way to fix it, that's even better. But that's the only way I could think of because if you tr just try to add a piece of pipe to it and lay bricks over it, that's going to be a major time-consuming – this is a – couple of pieces of iron bought from local Judy's Iron and Metal sells that, and it can be fixed, and the liability is gone immediately. Um, let's see. When will the next meeting – when will the meetings be open to the public? I'm catching a lot of – you know, the courthouse. They said the courthouse is meeting on the lawn outside. We need to meet out there. Of course, we'd have to have lights out. Um, if we met outside, but um, should we start thinking about scheduling at a different location where we can have people at a social distance of six feet to where they could attend the meetings? Um, the biggest thing we run into is the hardware. You'd have to move. It would have to be in some place like where we have access to the internet so that we could. Right, like the Ellis Fine Arts Center. Could we set it up at the Ellis Fine Arts Center for the next meeting, talk to the college, and see if we could meet out there? Okay. Let's get that. Let's see if we can get that set up. Maybe an on-site meeting at Buck Run, to where we can fire the mics up down there and people can sit around in folding chairs. How much longer do we have before they open up under the governor's? It would be the week after. So it would be the well, week after our next meeting. So yeah. One more closed meeting, and then we go from there. It seems like a lot. I'm sorry. I'm, That's okay. Uh, a lot of lot of shuffling to. Do for one meeting. And again, I will reiterate that back when I was a commissioner before, which is how I come up with examples of what I'm doing now, we did on the road meetings. It was really cool. I mean, we went over to the whatever that was called where the nuns lived over there. We did meetings there. We did meetings at the college. We did meetings. And we that allowed people from a different area every time. We did meetings at the fire station. That We did them over there at the new fire station, the old fire station. We did meetings all over town. Do you remember, Diane? We, we would do on-the-road meetings all the time, and I loved it. And people, we would get a different array of people every time. They had never been to a city meeting, but they drove by and seen the cars. We even had hot dogs and chips, which I don't know if we can afford that nowadays. But it was really cool. It was more like a public um, brawl, as you would say. I don't know. It wasn't a brawl. But it was, it was good, and it, it let people come out and, and express their opinions. So I would like to see if we could either – I'd like to say, Dave, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to check in to see him about using it buck run at the next meeting. Yeah, that would be great. Talk to Tom and see if we can get a put down there. I think that people would really enjoy getting back out there and some folding chairs out there and, and have it. Well, as long as it doesn't interfere with the uh, – Square dance? The pickleball. Right. Um, can't interfere with pickleball. So the other thing is – and also as far as technology and putting it on the thing, um, I talked to Josh Jones, and he said he would Facebook it. If that was the, if that was going to be a, a problem. Right. When we go from YouTube to Facebook, because now we're now we're yeah, realizing we're YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Now we're recording our meetings yeah. and so how long we break away from that. Yeah. 
That's true. That is very true. That's a, that's a legal issue that we have to address. Yeah. And we have to make sure wherever we go has the provision for the hearing issue as well. We get, that's a constraint. We want to make sure we're well, we're, test it. We need to make sure we test it. I, I don't want to get over there and have had a meeting scheduled and get there and nothing works. I know. Yeah, I, I believe that too. And I also know that you know, I believe Tom has things down there at Buck Run that have intercom or uh, not intercoms, but microphones and amplifiers and stuff like that for dances they put on. So we hopefully we can figure something out. And the last thing I have, Dave, is I don't know where um, where we're at on the prisoner thing. I just thought about that when I saw the brick streets. Getting a hold of us whenever they felt like they had enough staff and they could get. Um, I sorry. I can't hear you, Dave. They were supposed to call, get a hold of us whenever they felt like they could start letting up the. Looses, loosening, loosening their restrictions there, and they had enough staffing. So maybe that'll come up on whenever this day we're talking about the twenty second or whatever. Okay, wh what do you? The twenty seconds whenever we move into yeah, the next you phase. Yeah, you want them to come and talk? If yeah, maybe I possibly we get we just move farther forward in our um, talking to them about using the inmates to help with the bricks. Or yeah. whatever, whatever we do, if we have a, a meeting with just us and, and then bring yeah, it to okay. the commission. Right. Yeah, I was going to say because we, we need to decide how that's all going right, to work. Right, yeah. yeah, we need to, see, need to get the uh, the basics I worked will, out. Uh, I will reach out to Bobby Reed tomorrow and find out what they're feeling. I'd appreciate that. That's all I have. Pete? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of items. Uh, number one on my list is where are we? On our street advisory board, more than a month ago, we were uh, we uh, set that up, uh, and uh, whose responsibility is it? Is it the the members of the board to uh, uh, get together and uh, and and do their election of officers and set up their their meeting, or is it up to Dave or Susan or? Where, where are we as far as getting that? You know, we desperately need that. Sure. That yeah. going. Yep, we agree. Um, we had uh, kind of delayed it based on the phases and where we were as far as having meeting, but we're going to go ahead and have a meeting next week. We finally got a hold of everyone, and we have a quorum, and so we're going to have a meeting next week. So next Tuesday, right? Here. Next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Here. And it is not open to the public because we're, it's not lift, lifted yet of how many people we can have in a room, but we are at least going to get organized and um, put the meeting online so people can watch. Okay. 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 That answers that then. So that's, that's on. I would uh, also uh, like uh, Diane to uh, read into the minutes of the meetings, uh, a page that I sent uh, uh, on accommodation of handicap persons, particularly me. If you could read that into the uh, minutes of the meeting. You want him in today, the, mi the minutes today? Do what? You want that into your comments for today? Comments? Yeah. And under the comments section for tonight's meeting, is that where you want that put? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will do that. <laughs> also, I had a... Uh, you know, uh, we we skipped by, which I tried to uh, get put in place, but we we skipped by citizens' comments. Uh, this is a uh, a uh, an issue that I had a uh, a citizen uh, told me that they sent in a a, uh, a comment to uh, Diane to have read on the uh, agenda tonight and that comment did not get has not been read as yet could we get that read according to the agenda the notice we gave to the public was that we weren't taking public comments but that they could send something into diane and it'd be distributed to the uh, commissioners and it has been uh, it, if you check your emails, everybody was emailed a copy of that um, when Dan gave it to me this afternoon. And I also emailed the uh, the, the uh, person who submitted it and advised him that um, while we've been in COVID, the agenda clearly says we're not going to take public comments except by email and they'll be distributed. And they were. So. Well, I have no idea what the, uh, what the uh, uh, comments were or involved. Uh, and uh, when 
when you uh, when you send that out, you put that on Dropbox, right? I, well, I didn't get any. His, I didn't get any comment. His comment was his comment was sent today, and so it was too late to make it into the packet um, easily for you guys. So what we did was we emailed it, and since since it wasn't the format that he put it in, he wanted us to read it in. Well, that's just we haven't been uh, the format we've used for the last several meetings. Clearly stated on the agenda was that there wouldn't be uh, citizen comments due to the the problem we've got with COVID and our our changed procedure, um, but that they could get their. Uh, their comments to the commissioners by emailing uh, Diane, which we did. And the other problem we've got too is that his comment was about an item that was uh, already on the agenda for, uh, it was about uh, Commissioner you know, Kevin Allen's issue about the, uh, uh, the vacancy thing. So had he been here, he wouldn't have uh, been able to talk about an item that's already on the agenda. Um, at the commissioner, the, the key citizen comments period is for things that aren't otherwise on the agenda to provide you guys information. So his, if you guys check your emails, and I had an email for you that was um, turf yards, I believe, or something. I have one for you, and that that didn't go out until just a little bit before the meeting. You probably were already on your way here, but we can provide you. I think we've got a copy of it. We can get it for you today if you want it, but it's in your inboxes. Um, it just got here so late today that there was no way to get it distributed in the agenda. Okay. That's fine. That's all I have. Okay. Lindsay? Um, I don't have anything further. Thank you. Dr. Nichols? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I wrote down my comments because I think it gets late, and I'll be try to be as concise as I can. Uh, first thing I, w I wanted to do was uh, I said I just wrote I, I want to express my admiration for the people who peacefully exercise their right to gather and protest last evening um, and to those people their message of racism and inequalities as highlighted by the killing of George Floyd is being heard nationally but to me it's importantly that it's being heard locally and to those folks I think uh, and I don't know who they were I think Travis knows but uh, essentially start a local grassroots movement. Um, and I'm sure those people have probably experienced issues that we haven't. So um, I, my offer would be, or my personal offer, but I assume you all would also be engaged if we in the city government can be some part of a solution that, that we could help with, I'd please ask them to contact us so that it's not, not just these recent protests, but the underlying problem is identified and moved forward with if we can do something to make this city better for everybody engaged. I hope that makes sense. Bottom line is I appreciate what they did. In, in conjunction with the HET, um, I want to acknowledge law enforcement. Um, to me, that picture of uh, Travis uh, sort of brings tears to my eyes every time I see it. Uh, he, you know, uh, I don't know, I assume you all have seen it since you're on Facebook more than I am, but uh, I mean, here he is, a small child at his knee, and I just think that what I said was that speaks volumes to me about what is, what can, and what should be. Uh, so, Chief, um, thanks to you and, and the department for what I said was be, uh, doing triple duties uh, for being ambassadors for the city, for supporting the rights of the protesters, and for protecting our city. I, I really mean that, so thank you. Uh, on a less emotional issue for me, um, I, this, this, is, this is different, and at your uh, place, I will tell you, there, there is information from Smart Growth America and uh, also this uh, um, Wagner Strategic Information uh, Policy. So here it goes. This is longer, and I, I apologize, but I really need to do it. Uh, so first, I, I want to thank uh, Rachel and Allie. Uh, last week, they represented Fort Scott in a three-morning Smart Growth America teleconference you know, that I sat in on. Um, they represent us very well. Uh, they were professional, they were prepared, they are well-spoken, insightful, and ultimately very enthusiastic to use the information to move us forward. So uh, my, my thanks to them for, for being engaged. Having said that, uh, let me take us down a different place. Um, here, my understanding, and I, I said understand where we are, and I mean within the, the realm of our city and finances. Uh, Dave, Dave, to me, has done an excellent uh, job moving us forward with the limited financial resources we have. But because our financial pie is only so big, no matter how we slice it, there's only so much to go around. Uh, because of that, I, I think we're in what I've always felt like is a reactive and not a proactive situation. 
and, our, and must use our uh, money to address the most urgent problems or, or opportunities as they arise. Uh, to become proactive and actually reach many of our desired goals, it seems evident to me we need a detailed strategic plan to give action to our existing master vision plan. Uh, this would allow us to budget our local dollars more strategically and give more focused directions to our efforts to obtain federal and state funds. Seems to me that we need to expand our vision and broaden our focus to meet the community at large needs and expectations. So over the past two years, we, we have been engaged with the Wagner Group at Smart Growth America. Uh, they, working in coordination, have both evaluated Fort Scott and um, in front of you are the documents they have constructed. Uh, these organizations have national perspective, have experience in guiding large and small towns, have access to lobbying expertise and our resources to multiple funding opportunities. Uh, these documents uh, summarize uh, the two organizations' opinions of our community strength and needs. They then give specific steps and processes to guide us in designing and implementing a comprehensive strategic plan. Um, in them are our recognition of the issues we have been stuck in these plans are, are recognitions of um, the, the issues we have been stuck on, like infrastructure, housing and codes, transportation, downtown development, uh, uh, preparing and attracting jobs for the future, supporting current business, industry, and, and probably some others. Our bottom line is uh, we now have the tools to develop in conjunction with community members because they're involved a forward-looking, comprehensive, strategic plan. I think we'd be foolish not to aggressively use these resources. So I use that as an explanation because what I'm going to do is turn to Dave and say, um, so um, to you all, I'm asking you to become familiar with the information. I think it's important. I think it's a great guidepost, and, and we really can use it. And then to Dave, uh, I'm asking you to assign somebody, probably Rachel and Allie, uh, to bring us an agenda item describing the nuts and bolts process of how we proceed. It's actually outlined in here, but it, it, it should be individualized to each community. We were on the call with five other communities from a variety of places in America, all accessing these resources. They had been in the program for two or three years and have had great success in moving their communities forward. So uh, to me, so, so we need to, I'm going to ask you to do that. Um, and I think right now we have kind of this window of planning opportunity to street street uh, is set up for that that organization but this gives us several months to really look at a detailed plan and i think get us all on the on the board and i mean that ultimately this could be the legacy of this commission moving forward that we leave the community with this footprint to to, to do and to plan so that's my speech for tonight but that's that's my ask for you Dave. okay got it i quit i'm done um, the only thing that I wanted to add, kind of in conjunction with the um, code of procedure and the code of ethics, I guess just uh, just totally an opinion, um, I think that it's always important whether our meetings go an hour or they go four hours or three hours or whatever that might be, I think it's important for um, everyone that watches or talks with us about it or whatever to realize or to understand that the time is not the issue, it's productivity. So whether we sit here for an hour or we sit here for seven hours, I think it's very important from what I hear back from people in the community for us to be productive and to continually move the city forward. So I don't, I don't really think that it's anybody's objection as to how long they sit here. I think it's more so of what we get accomplished and how well we work together. I've had discussion that's been brought to me of of not being able to work together and not have you know being affected together and I will be the first one to say that I would certainly like to see that change some um, whether we do that in 15 minutes or we do it at midnight it's kind of, it's really irrelevant but I think by maybe putting things like that in place maybe it is we'll hold each of us accountable to be in respectful as a governing body that works together to bring the city forward with everyone having dif different expertise and different knowledge to bring to us to educate us for us to make the best decisions yeah. well said. so um, that's all i have it shortened up the meetings a lot if everybody just agreed with what i said <laughs>
And how did I know that's what you were going to say? That case I mean, if, I, if you guys want to save time. That case moved to adjourn. That's a suggestion. <laughs> Second. Hang on. <laughs> rush Diane. Pete Allen. We're adjourning. Kevin Allen. Yes. Lindsey Watts. Yes. Randy Nichols. Yes. Jolene Mitchell. Yes. <laughs> now we're leaving. Man. I ordered two new 